This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the June 29th meeting of the Amherst Town Council to order at 6.32. Um, give, um, the meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Amherst Media. It is also being recorded. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena know, and they will be monitoring that. If there's te technical difficulties during the meeting, uh, we will pause the meeting or ad and address the situation or determine that we have no way of doing so. Um, the town has developed a two minute video. If you'd like to see how you can find out more about that. In fact, that's on your screen right now is the link for that video. Uh, we have a few announcements. We're going to show them on the screen. And I just want to make sure you notice the special town council meeting on the 6th with regard to public safety on the 13th with regard to the library. And that is also the night that we will have our budget hearing. You can move up to the next, which is the meetings of the committees. And you'll notice that there's a fair number of finance committee meetings. And that is because we are in the process of um, working on our budget as of tonight. Um, we are going to be going immediately now into the hearing with regard to parking regulations on University Drive South. So if you, for the moment, would take that down. I'm going to be calling on Dave Zomack and Tom Reedy, uh, but before I do that, this is a hearing to determine whether the town council will approve the proposed parking regulation changes on University Drive South. This hearing is being held in accordance with general bylaws section 3.14B, parking and delivery and charter sections 2.14 regulation control of the public ways. Specifically, this public hearing is to review the proposal on changes requested by U Drive South LLC specifically to regulate future parking being constructed in accordance with ZBA 2020-26 special permit as follows. And it gets very specific. Eight meters par metered parallel on street spaces along University Drive South, timing of meters to be determined at future dates and 12 off street parking spaces in the dead end space off of Uni University Drive South be regulated 8 o'clock a.m. to 5 p.m. for use by visitors to the building, known as One University Drive South, located at 348 Northampton Road. It refers to map 12D, lot 19, and properties identified as University Drive South, map, map 13D, lot 56 and 57, and Snell Street, map 13, lot 55, and to be regulated as permit parking from 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. for residents of the building known as One University Drive South. And it goes on to basically cite the exact same maps and locations. Uh, the Town of Amherst bylaw 3.14b also requires that notice of the public hearing be posted the, at least the first of those postings 14 days before the hearing, both on the town bulletin board published in the newspaper. The notice was posted online on June 17th, 2020. It was published in the Daily Hampshire Gazette on June 15th and, 20, and June 22nd. And a notice was sent to Butters on June 18th, 2020. Town Council Public Ways Policy maintains the granting of long-term and permit, permanent use of the public way, including parking, to the council. Town, Town of Amherst General Bylaw 
3.14 requires a simple majority vote of the full council for passage of this change. So we're opening the hearing at this point and David and Tom, I believe you've indicated some slides you'd like us to show. Uh, yes, thank you, Lynn. Perhaps I'll start and then uh, if Mr. Reedy would like to uh, uh, chime in, I'd also like to just acknowledge that uh, Christine Brestrup, our planning director is on the call and if there are specific questions related to the ZBA process or planning overall for this site and, and this project, I'm sure Christine would be happy to, uh, to uh, weigh in. So Tom, if, if you will, perhaps I could just say a few, few uh, introductory remarks and then um, if you wanted to add anything. Um, I think I just wanted to show a couple of quick slides. These are all from the applicant. Uh, this is a slide looking south from University Drive. Route 9 uh, is the main corridor um, uh, east to west. And then we have the, if you will, uh, dead end section of uh, the former uh, uh, south uh, part of, of uh, what, what was going to be a, a, uh, a street all the way south to South Hadley. Uh, and, and again, I think the, the council has heard quite a bit of uh, uh, about this project already. So I'm going to be try to be brief and go right through some things very quickly. I would refer anyone, uh, the council or anyone on this uh, Zoom call to the town manager's memo of, of May 15th. Um, this is a mixed use development uh, proposed by uh, Mr. Robert, the, Roberts, the applicant. Um, it is um, 45 residential units uh, with commercial on the first floor. Uh, it also uh, is important to note that there are um, affordable units in the residential component of the project. The ZBA special permit um, uh, has already been, uh, of course, it's already been through the ZBA process and the special permit was granted. There was also an extensive uh, notice of intent process with the Conservation Commission. It is a complex site with some wetlands uh, that traverse um, uh, throughout and the applicant was very um, responsive to the Conservation Commission's concerns and adjusted the project accordingly. Um, the project does propose significant use of the public way as you see it here. Perhaps we could go to the next slide showing what is proposed. Um, here, here is showing a, a profile of the building as proposed. I want to I want to emphasize that this project has received significant input from the planning department, from the Department of Public Works, the engineering staff, and and Guilford Boring, our superintendent of Public Works. And the project has, uh, I guess I would say, gotten better with time and with the input. The applicant has been very open and responsive to the input provided by the town. Um, there will be a roundabout as shown uh, heading over towards Snell Street and then the proposal for the use of the public way would be on street metered parking and off street permit parking. Um, it is of note that the applicant will be paying for all the, the improvements that are done in the public way and DPW staff will be working closely with the applicant if use of the public way is granted to construct uh, what you see before you. Uh, overall, town staff are very supportive of the project and the improvements. I think uh, the general consensus of, of staff is that this is the right project in the right location. Um, the parking proposed is to support the commercial and residential use of the building. And I would also note that the parking will provide both the permit parking and the metered parking will provide a source of revenue uh, for the town in the future. Uh, to get to the parking specifically, there is a need for 20 spaces, 12 spaces off the dead end, if you will. And I think we can go to the next slide, which would be permit. Well, actually, let's go back. Sorry about that. Let's go to the previous. There we go. Uh, so there'd be 12 spaces, uh, which would be permit uh, parking, and then eight parallel spaces along the western edge of um, U Drive South. So I think I'll stop there. If Mr. Reedy wants to add more detail, um, I would defer to the chair to call on Mr. Reedy. Thank you. Mr. Reedy. 
Thanks. I'm not rendered speechless that often, but I think David did an incredible job. And um, if there are specific questions, I'm more than happy to answer. But um, I think he gave a great overview of where we were uh, and where we are now. And, and we'd appreciate a, a positive vote here. Um, this is the process. We start with counselor questions, then we go on to audience questions, and then we go on to people in favor of the project from the public and people who would like to speak in opposition. And then finally back for more questions from the council and council discussion. So does the council have any questions at this time? Okay. Then I'd like to see any raised hands in attendees to see if the public has any questions at this time. Kelly, would you please state your name and where you live? Hi, um, I live at 34 Baker Street, which is the street in that image that is just in the left upper corner. Okay, Kelly. Um, if you would like, you could um, also show your video so that people could see your face. It's up to uh, you. Okay. Um, at the moment, I'd rather just speak and not um, just because I don't want to mess this up. Okay, thank in you. In any way. Um, so in the image in the top left corner, the uh, Baker Street is the first street. As you round the corner off of University Drive, you make the left up snow. Baker is the street that abuts this project. and. Um, the town may think that this is the right project um, at the right time, at the right location, um, but uh, I don't. Um, as one of I'm I'm one of the first houses on Baker Street, and the turn that I make every day of my life, the left turn, and then the turn onto University Drive to go onto Route Nine. Um, as well as the turn up Snell towards the uh, train trestle where the road narrows considerably. Like I, I can't, like I can't, the impact on, on the quiet corner of my life of this project is immense. Um, the project that was approved during the quarantine and the pandemic when there was no meetings, you know, I, I, feel, I feel like I can't even believe that this is being done to our quiet corner. I want to know what is going to be done with the flow of traffic up Snell. Um, you know, I, I want to know, you know, you're introducing so much to this quiet corner. You know, at first it was the parking lot that we had to deal with for the apartment building, but now the dead end, which again, right now is just quiet woods you're going to put 20 parking spots. I, I, I can't, you know, I can't, I, I'm, I am uh, blown away. Uh, and I feel like, I feel like if you're gonna do this to this tiny little street, there are six houses on Baker Street. You're gonna do this as quiet, tiny little wooded corner. I, I, I feel like the people who live here need to know more, what is it gonna do to us? There hasn't been enough information provided. Are there additional comments um, at this time? Uh, Christine, you have your hand up. This is Christine Brestrup, who is the head of planning for the town. Good evening, um, Chris Brestrup, planning director. I just wanted to note for the record that this case was um, completed on March 12th, which was before the shutdown, and it was when uh, everyone was meeting in person, so it wasn't done, you know, under cloak of darkness um, during the pandemic. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Are there any other questions from attendees, from the public? Please raise your hand. Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and ask if there's any people from the public who would like to speak in favor of the project. Okay, and then uh, anybody ad in addition to Kelly 
who would like to speak in opposition to the project. Okay, then we're going to go back to uh, counselor questions. Um, Dorothy Pam, you have your hand up. Please unmute. If the design did not have the roundabout where the permit parking is to be, um, then there would be more of a possibility. I'm, I'm really asking because I'm not a traffic expert. Um, doesn't this, doesn't that roundabout, isn't it a traffic calming thing, keeping people from zipping around that corner? That's the question for, I guess, for a traffic person. So that would go back to David or somebody from the town staff. I'm wondering if Chris might, Lynn, if I could. Sure, please. I wonder if Chris might be able to address that. And, and I also wonder if Tom might be able to say something about the site plan, which uh, my understanding and, and having been through many of the Conservation Commission meetings, the site plan clearly uh, took great pains and spent a lot of time um, trying to retain the vegetated buffer and the tree buffer to the south. So perhaps Tom could address the uh, some of the concerns about uh, buffering from the previous speaker, and then Chris might be able to say something about uh, the the small roundabout there. Um, I will say that DPW does see this as a as an improvement for for the street and the traffic. It is it's it's currently quite an odd configuration, and and uh, is not clear, particularly when. Um, vehicles are entering the intersection now and then headed towards Snell, um, it has always been a very awkward uh, transition there. So perhaps Chris and Tom could elaborate on a few of those topics. Okay, let's go to Tom first. Sure, thanks a lot, uh, Madam President and Mr. Zomek. So if, you're, if you look at this slide that's in front of you, um, at the top of the slide, you'll see a tree line that is the existing tree line. So if you were to drive by this property today and see the tree line, that tree line is not changing. So the, we're, the, the applicant is not cutting into that tree line at all. Everything is happening to the north of that tree line. Um, this has been a process too. I don't want to, again, to, to support Ms. Brestrup's comment. We started this conversations with the town in 2018, had been through the Conservation Commission, I believe in 2019, and then started this Zoning Board of Appeals process at the end of last calendar year. Uh, and I, uh, we had a hearing in January, well before the pandemic hit. And then as Ms. Brestrup mentioned, uh, the last hearing was March 12th, uh, where we received approval. And then as maybe if we could go to the previous slide, I think you'll, you'll get to Mr. Zomek's point about somewhat the unregulated nature of this intersection uh, you can see that if you look at near the dead end, just the, the traffic pattern, you'll see that it's, you know, it's a 50 foot wide road. Is it one lane or two? And then what happens when folks get to the southerly end of um, the separator? Where do people go? So it was the town engineer that suggested as a traffic calming measure that the roundabout, the roundabout go in. And if you go to the slide that we were just on, you'll see that the way the, the geometry of the design is such where folks entering need to think about what they're doing. And that's why you've got kind of the, the uh, choke points, if you will, at, at each of the entrances and the geometry of the um, curbs. Drivers know they're entering into a roundabout well before they enter into the roundabout. And so then probably subconsciously take into consideration where they need to be looking and what they need to do. And so during the uh, process, we also had a traffic engineer discuss the impact on the surrounding roadway. One of the issues is that train trestle really limits through traffic. I know that folks that live there and I'm, I live in South Hadley and I'll use that road as well. 
you know, that's a, a traffic calming measure in and of itself. So it's the expectation that m most of the folks utilizing or, or residing in this building will be utilizing Route 9. So the, the traffic engineer concluded it wasn't going to have a significant impact on the surrounding roadways. Ms. Brushtrup, if you have more to add, please do. I also want to mention that Guilford Mooring is with us as a panelist and he may have a comment with regard to the traffic. Go ahead, Christine. So I just wanted to comment that um, traffic circles or roundabouts are considered to be traffic calming measures. And so this one being a very small roundabout would certainly be a traffic calming measure at that end of the street. Okay, Guilford, did you wanna to add to that at this time? Uh, yes, please. Um, <clears throat> we were actually, when we first got this project, we were concerned that we were building something like is on Old Farm Road where the Stavros house is. We have kind of the same situation where the road takes a sharp 90 degree turn and then you go into a parking lot for a business. <clears throat> we have lots of conflicts there, and but the traffic volume there is much lower than we believe the traffic volume here would be. <clears throat> so we, we kind of guided them to this roundabout. We're, we're really happy with the design and we're, we're confident this will slow people down and calm the, the intersection and make, and make everybody have a better traffic movement and get in and out of the buildings and in and out of the neighborhood much better than it would without doing the roundabout. Andy Steinberg, you have your hand up, please. Yes, uh, it was about the traffic study question, which has actually been answered substantially. Is there any, uh, as a part of the study, uh, traffic count as far as projected additional traffic generated by the new building? But if I may, yes, it, it was. I don't have the data in front of me, but that was part of the study um, that was done. I, I think given the residential component, which is 45 units, they're, they're all either studio or one bedroom. And so you're talking about maybe one vehicle per unit, but I, I think the attraction of this site, um, it was designed more as a, a non-auto oriented development because of its proximity to the PBTA bus stop, uh, as well as the bike trail. Uh, and then also the other amenities, Big Y, CVS, University, Amherst College, et cetera. So we didn't think that the residential component would add a significant amount of vehicle trips. And then the, the commercial space is maxed out at 4,700 square feet, which again, isn't incredibly large, um, likely to be a ophthalmologist's office with regimented schedules, folks coming in to appointments. So it's not like, a. I, I'm sure everybody was familiar that this was proposed to be a Walgreens some odd years ago which has less regulation in the number of vehicles that would be there. So given the residential component and also the minimal commercial component, um, it, it, it wasn't a material impact on the surrounding area. Okay. Is there any further comment uh, from Guilford or anybody else at this time? We have one more question from Kelly? Yeah, but there's also the, the issue of 20 parking spaces, right, which are public parking spaces, right? You have your parking lot there that's for the residents of the building, but you're adding parking spaces that are metered. I'm, I believe I'm correct. They're metered spaces. That is correct. So you're adding public parking spaces, again, to a quiet residential corner, um, which is a concern. It's a concern for me. It's a concern for me as, again, as, as the resident of this quiet residential corner. Um, you know, I know I'm only voicing my grievances and I know I'm not gonna get anywhere by saying any of this, but I just feel like I'm the lone voice here saying that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm devastated that this is happening. And that's all I got to say. Uh, we always want to make sure we hear from our, from the public and thank you for your comment. Christine, you had a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Uh, my understanding of the 
um, discussion with the Zoning Board of Appeals. And of course, this is completely under the control of the town council and then possibly the town manager. But my understanding was that the um, parallel spaces along University Drive right in front of the building were potentially going to be metered spaces. So those are eight spaces there. And then the other parking spaces beyond that, the 12 other parking spaces were potentially going to be permit parking spaces. And Mr. Reedy may be able to clarify that more, but that was my understanding. So they are not all gonna be um, hourly metered spaces. And if there's a fear that students would park here and then hop the bus to the university, I don't think there would be enough time for them parking at those metered spaces to do that. This is really intended for um, the ophthalmology office where somebody would go in and maybe be there for one or two hours, not you know half a day or a full day. So just wanted to share those thoughts with you. There is one more public comment. Zoe Crabtree, please identify yourself and where you live. Hello, hi, I live um, in South Amherst. Uh, my name is Zoe Crabtree. Um, I just think this is a really good opportunity to speak up for more affordable housing, small units, especially for students in this space. Um, I understand where the other person is, is coming from. Um, and I just think that affordable housing is really, really important. I don't know what the cost of these units is looking at being, but I know that we have a shortage of housing spaces here, um, and I would love to make it easier for people to live here. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the council or discussion from the council? If not, I'm going to declare that the hearing is closed, but we actually are going to move immediately to the uh, item to vote. And so I will need a second to the following motion and it's to approve regulation of eight meters parallel on street spaces along University Drive South. Timing of meter to be, metering to be determined at a future date and 12 offsite parking spaces in the dead end off of University Drive South to be regulated 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. for use by visitors to the no, building known as One University Drive South, located at 348 Northampton Road, map 13D, lot 19, and properties identified as University Drive South, map 13D, lot 56 and 57, and Snell Street, map 13D, lot 55 and to be regulated as permitted parking 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. for residents and of the building known as University Drive South located at 348 Northampton Road, map 13, lot 19, 13D, lot 19, and properties identified as University Drive South, map, map 13D, lot 56 and 57, and Snell Street, map 13D, lot 55. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, is there any further discussion by the council? Then we are going to move to a roll call vote. Okay, and I ask the students that are joining us to just be patient, okay? Um, the first vote is uh, Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy Dumont. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Aye. Steve Schreiber. Aye. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Sarah Schwartz is absent and Shalini Ball Milne. Yes. The vote is 12 in favor, zero, zero, and one absent. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we are going to move on to an item that is actually brought to us by Kathleen Perkins, who is a third grade teacher at Crocker Farm. And during the past several months, um, she and her students have been working on 
the expansion of little libraries to have three more little libraries. And so as you see various different people joining us, it's because we've invited her and the parents and the students of these um, of her class who have just finished the school year. Um, I just want to mention the town council has had the opportunity to meet with a previous group of Ms. Perkins when they came to us a year ago to put up little libraries again in the general vicinity of Crocker Farm. The, um, they're coming to us now, even though the libraries won't be able to actually go up because they won't be painted until the fall when the students reconvene. But I want to mention that the libraries that are up already have not only books in them, but they have snacks as well as treats like water and juice. And so they're being used for students in a variety of different ways. My cat has gone nuts, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think what we need to do is have um, Ms. Perkins, Kathleen, uh, please present. We have slides and we know that you've put these together with the students. And we're gonna go ahead and watch the slide presentation and have you talk about the project. Thank you, President Griesmer and Town Council for having us. Um, I just want to say quickly that uh, this is an incredible and amazing group of children and third graders, if you want to turn your, your camera on so we can see you, that would be fine. Um, we've been working hard on this project despite our unique circumstance of not actually being together in the classroom right now. Um, for those of you who saw our presentation last year, this will be different because um, the students and I have not actually been in the classroom together to kind of practice um, the presentation. We do have some students at the end of the slideshow who wanted to share their thoughts just on why this is a great idea. Um, so I'm going to walk us through the slides and then you can hear their voices. So this is the, reader, the Crocker Farm Read Around Town Expansion Project presented by the Room 26 third graders. Next slide, please. And here we are. This is this year's class. Um, each year, the third grade class is are the library stewards, meaning they, they take care of the libraries, make sure that they're stocked, make sure that they're in good repair, make sure that they're beautiful. Um, next slide, please. So why is the expansion of Read Around Town an important community initiative? Well, I asked the experts who are the third grade students, and here's what they had to say. Next slide, please. Asher Gordon said, I think adding three more free little libraries at public bus stops is important because it can give people a thing they can do that is not on a screen. That makes it important because being on a screen for too long can be very bad. Also, it is at bus stops. That makes it important because people can read on the go. Also, everyone can have a new book each day. That makes it important because no one will get bored with the same books. And finally, everyone can share their books with everyone. That makes it important because it helps the little free library continue. That is why I think we should have three more little free libraries at public bus stops. Next slide, please. Julia Seitz, who um, I hope is coming, um, said there should be more little free libraries because it is fun for people to walk to them. It gives you a nice little giddy feeling of hope and surprise to find out what books might be there. Sometimes we have left some books there. This can feel hard, but it's nice knowing that other people from our community will find them and get to enjoy them. Next slide, please. Caleb Jones says, I think three more little libraries would be great for the town. One reason is if you get bored on the bus, you can read a book. Another reason is if you have reading in school, you can read on your way to school so your teacher won't get mad. And the final reason is if you have trouble reading in school, you can get some extra practice in so you'll be good for school. Next slide, please. And the final um, comment is from Saul Hirschberg, who says, Due to the coronavirus crisis, Ms. Perkins' class is trying to add three more little free libraries to different places in Amherst Map. Especially now, people are losing money and losing their jobs in this ghost town of stress. People are losing money to even read books. A little free library would help people with less money read books and have good education during this time. I still think that adding three more little free libraries to our town would make it a better place. These are the reasons why I would like to add little free libraries to our town and his contact information. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> So where would the new libraries be located? Well, we would like to install them at the following locations. 
bus stop 0145 at the corner of West Street and Mill Lane, bus stop 8011 at the corner of East Hadley Road and Columbia Drive, and bus stop 0152 on East Hadley Road in front of Mill Valley Estates. Next slide, please. Here is a map for you to look at, um, marked with our library locations. Next slide, please. And then the next three slides are pictures of the bus stops. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. What will the libraries look like? This year's libraries were ordered unfinished from the Little Free Library website thanks to our generous community donors. When we are all able to be together again at school in the fall, we look forward to painting them to be equally as beautiful as last year's libraries. Next slide, please. And here is a picture of the gorgeous libraries in their current unfinished state, waiting for third grade artists to make them beautiful. Next slide, please. Um, these are our three currently operating libraries. As you can see, they're quite lovely. Um, they get a lot of use. Every time I have gone to fill them up this past year, they have already been full. Um, they're really an important resource in our community. People are always sticking books in them. People have started putting CDs and DVDs in them. Um, and I, but as I mentioned, they're, they're, using, they're being used for a different purpose at this moment. Next slide, please. Who will install them? Um, that will be me and some community volunteers. This is a picture of a helper installing uh, one of last year's libraries, digging the deep hole and putting in the quick crete and installing the posts. Um, and then the libraries themselves are the, uh, are the last piece to be installed. Next slide, please. Where will the books come from? The three current libraries have become important community resources for many kids and families. While third graders and teachers fill them as needed, our neighbors add to the book collections as well. The current libraries are always full of great books. Next slide, please. Who will keep the libraries clean and in good condition? Each year, Room 26 third graders at Crocker Farm Elementary School are the official stewards of the libraries. Teachers and parents help too. We take great pride in our beautiful libraries and know that it is a very important job to take care of them. Next slide, please. Here's a fun fact. During the school closure, our three current libraries have been transformed into little free snack breweries. We raise money to purchase healthy snacks and drinks for anyone who would like them. Many people use our snack stations and they are refilled several times each week. Next slide, please. And sometimes we even receive, receive notes in our libraries from the people who enjoy them. This one says, thank you. This was so needed and welcome today. Gratefully, M. I don't know who that is, but it was lovely to get. Um, these third graders are definitely great changers who are making important things happen in our community for sure. And in summary, we think that the Read Around Town expansion project is absolutely definitely critically important and beneficial for the town of Amherst. We hope that you agree and we appreciate your consideration. Um, I see some third graders here. Would anyone like to tell the town council why you think it's a good idea to have more libraries at bus stops? You can raise a hand. Anyone wanna share their thoughts? Yes, Iris. Um, well, I think that we should have some more free, free little libraries for the town because if we have more free little libraries, then more people can read them and more people will donate because the more we have, the more books we'll have. And yeah, like Julia said, it might be a little hard to donate a book, but you'll know that it'll help someone and someone will really enjoy it. And there's, yeah, there's a feeling of gratitude if you donate a book. And if you take one, you should definitely leave one. Serge, would you please take down the slides so that we can see more of the audience? Thank you. Thank you, Iris. That was very, very well said. Any other third graders like to offer a thought? James or Justin, Laura? James, go ahead. Unmute. James, you need to unmute. Oh. We're having a little trouble hearing you, James. 
Maybe you need to turn your mic up, James. Technology can be so tricky. Hmm. Very interesting. I think he doesn't have his mic up because his mic he is unmuted. I think so too. Yeah. <clears throat> James, while you're working on that, I'm just going to see if anyone else has a comment, okay? Actually, Julie Seitz is in the attendee side. Oh. She has her hand raised. Okay, Julia, yes. Okay, you need to unmute, Julia. There you go. Thanks. So, first of all, I can't see. Um, I'm trying to let my... Oh. Did we bring you into the room? Yes, we see we see a box with a big A in it, Julia. So if you'd like to say something, please go ahead. We can hear you, Julia. It makes me sad to see it say goodbye to a good book, but it makes me really glad to see someone else reading a, um, a book and taking good care of it. Um, books connect people in Amherst, and um, I think that's very important. Thanks, Julia. Okay, are there other students that would like to speak? James, did you figure out your mic yet? I think I figured out. Okay. Justin, would you like to offer a thought? No? Laura? No, you don't have to. Okay. Um, well, James, did you figure out your mic? Oh, no. Lynn? Yes. I wonder if James has, if if his mic, he's trying to use a mic that's not on the computer, like if you had a headset plugged in, that oh. still thinks it's something like that, mm -hmm. and he has to switch which mic it's trying, okay. He's shaking his head no. I mean, I, I actually was at Miss Perkins' class, and the students all seemed to be very well connected, which was impressive. They, um, had a, we had a great hour, half hour meeting. Anybody else, Kathleen? I don't think so. Um, maybe James, maybe you can email me what you want to say and I could send it along to President Griezmann. Does that work? Yeah, okay. Um, I think that concludes our presentation. Okay, are there questions from the council? Yes, uh, Mandy Jo. I have one. The decorations on the Little Free Libraries are so adorable and cute and amazing. And they look like they each took a theme from an artist or something. How do you guys decide the themes? And do you know what the themes for these three will be? Um, we don't yet know what the themes for these three will be. Um, we actually were studying different artists last year with this project in mind. So kids were really kind of hands-on in choosing the three artists. We chose um, um, Yuyu Kusima and um, Georgia O'Keeffe and Saul DeWitt, Saul Lowitt. And um, we actually went to Math Mocha and we saw you know, a uh, an exhibition of Saul Lewitt's work. And so then the kids came back and we tried artwork in each of these styles. And then each kid got to um, have a piece of their artwork on one side of, of a library. So um, that was my vision for this year. It didn't quite go the way that I planned, <laughs> um, but we're gonna, we are going to um, figure out a creative way for, these kids to be able to decorate and take ownership of, of these libraries. Kathy Shane, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I'm curious about the kinds of books are that, that are being left. Are they mainly at the um, third, fourth, fifth grade reading level so that our kids picking out the books? Um, 
I, I'm partly, uh, we, our kids are now 40 and 36, but <laughs> I recently brought huge boxes of kids books to some friends whose kids were younger, but we still have some. So the types, you know, the age of the books that are being left, reading level. Good question. Does any, do any third graders who visit our libraries want to answer this question? I'll just give it a minute to see if anyone wants to. Iris, would you like to? Yes, Um. so we have all kinds of levels. There are ones for grown-ups for kids, and grown-ups and kids both come. So you can donate like any kind of book, basically. Thanks, Iris. Thank you very much. Are there other comments or questions from the council? I do want to ask, and Kathleen, I know you're going to, I know the answer, but you did have to talk to one of the departments at the town to make sure you got approval for this. Could you just tell us about that? Um, so I have not been in touch. I believe I needed to talk to Guilford Moore. Right. Um, I've not yet been in touch with him this year. Last year, um, I worked with uh, Jason Steele's and we met at each library and he marked the appropriate distance. Um, so I have not yet done that piece, um, but if this project is approved, I will get right on that. Right, and so the main thing is to make sure that it's not in the way of the buses or the snow plows. Yes. And Guilford right. is with us tonight, so he'll be expecting that when you're ready to mount them, you're ready to do that. Great. Any comment, Guilford? Okay. No. Okay. Then um, we have to have two votes tonight for this. The first is we have to, to, to suspend town council rule of procedure rule 8.4 for the current agenda item. And that allows us to vote tonight instead of having a second reading. So I will make the motion, which is to, to suspend town council rules of procedure rule 8.4 for the current agenda item. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Okay. And we, any other comments at this time? Then we will do a roll call vote. Uh, Pat DeAngelis? Yes. Darcy Dumont? Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Uh, Mandy Johanneke? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Steve Schreiber? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Melanie Balmilne? Big yes. <laughs> and Alyssa Brewer? Huge yes. <laughs> okay. All right. And that's just to allow us to vote. <laughs> Down to the nitty gritty. So the nitty gritty is to approve the request of the Crocker Farm Elementary School third grade class to install three, three little libraries on Amherst Public Ways, one adjacent to bus ID number 0145 at the corner of West Street, Route 116 and Mill Lane, one adjacent to bus ID number 8011 at the corner of East Hadley Road and Columbia Drive, and one adjacent to bus ID number 0152 on East Hadley Road in front of the Mill Valley Estates. Is there a second? Second, Shane. Kathy Shane. Okay, any further comments from the council? All right, then we're going to move. Darcy Dumont? Yes. Lynn Griesmer is yes. Mandy Johanneke? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes, what a great idea. Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. And Shantley Balmilne. Yes. Melissa Brewer. Yes. And Pat DeAngelis. Yes. The vote is 12 for this, none against, no abstentions. We do have one person absent. 
and we want to thank you for this wonderful project. <laughs> thank you all for this incredible opportunity. Third graders, we did it. That is what is called a unanimous vote. And I am very proud of you. And thank you again. We look forward to making our town even more beautiful with these important resources. And all of you have a safe summer. You as well. Thank you. Take good care. Yep. Bye. Bye. Uh, it is 722. So I'm actually going to check to see if we have public comment at this time. I don't see any public comment. And then I also want to just check to see if all of the people who are associated with the um, proclamation are here. And unfortunately, Tracy is here. Tracy is here. Tracy is here, but uh, Franklin is not. Um, and we're actually not going to get to this till 7.30. Um, Chris Lynn, could we do the yes. consent agenda with just removing the resolution yeah. completely from it? Thank you. I think that's perfectly fine. Okay, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. And the consent agenda is... Uh, these are the items that were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. As in the past, if you want to remove an item, please let me know and I will remove it from this vote and we will then take it up afterwards. Um, so I'm going to go through the items first and make sure that you know which they are and why. First is the adoption of the resolution, but we're going to skip that and do the resolution separately. Okay. The second is to suspend rule 8.4 for the following agenda item, and that is separate consideration of the capital improvement program. Uh, 88, eight, as in the number 8E, referral of FY21 budget to the Finance Committee. We'll have a full presentation on the budget. This is just to refer, which must be done by the council. 9A1, 9A2, A to B, approval of town manager appointments to the following multiple member bodies. Cultural Council, Board of Health, Conservation Commission, Public Shade Tree Committee. And then also separately, the Elementary School Building Committee, both the town and, uh, and school staff members and the town council and school committee members. And then finally, approval of the minutes for July 15th, the special town council meeting on the capital improvement program presentation. July 15th, the special town council meeting on the capital improvement program public forum. And July 15th, the regular town council meeting. Is there any counselor who would like any item removed at this time? And consider that a motion. And is there a second? Mandy seconds. Okay, then we'll do a roll call vote. And we start with, I guess, Griesmer. And the answer is yes. Haneke. Yes. Bam. Yes. Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Shane. Yes. Driver. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Balmel. Yes. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. Yes. Dumont. Yes. The votes 12, 0, 0, and one absent. And I just want to see whether or not we have. Franklin was not actually going to speak 
uh, and we're not reading the full um, proclamation, but we are actually going to move to the resolution denouncing xenophobia and discrimination against Asians and Asian Americans. And Tracy, who is one of the sponsors, along with three counselors, they are uh, Shalini, Dorothy, and Darcy. And Tracy, you had some things you might comment on. Please unmute, unmute your mic. And if you want to, you may also be seen by the camera. That's fine. There you go. There you go. Hi. Okay. Um, I was actually just messaging Franklin to see if he was still coming. Um, he, and, he, had, he had said earlier that I could speak, and so I will. But um, he's much more of an expert on these things than I. Um, so yeah, so before you here, you see this resolution denouncing xenophobia and discrimination against Asians and Asian Americans. Um, there was a similar resolution that was passed in Northampton in May. Um, there's also been similar resolutions introduced in Congress in both the Senate and the House. Um, so we asked the council to consider this resolution just to reiterate that Amherst is a welcoming community and supportive of everyone who lives here. Um, with COVID-19, um, there's it's acerbated the historical discrimination and harassment of Asians and Asian Americans, um, including in some of the language that you see in the media. Um, so we really see this as a first step, um, you know, in terms of just affirming this. And then the next step would be conversations and action to implement and to make people actually feel safer. Um, and I just want to thank the council for considering this resolution and and thanks to the council sponsors and also to Franklin Odo. Mm -hmm. um, and George, uh, this has been and so forth by GOL. Would you like to report please? Yes, just briefly, we, we met um, as a committee on June 17. We had an excellent conversation with the sponsors, including Tracy and Franklin. Um, and um, that's reflected, I think, in document you have in front of you. And we voted 5-0 to declare it clear, consistent, and actionable. Okay. Question, Shalini. Uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Tracy and Frank and also uh, speak as, um, uh, I just want to say that before I joined town council, I was not aware of what can be done and how to raise these concerns. And I just want all the residents to know, especially people of color, that uh, the town council is committed to making this a safe place for each of you and uh, and this is, as Tracy mentioned, just our first step and showing our commitment to making this a safe town for everyone. And also I, I invite this resolution, I'm hoping this resolution is also a reminder to the residents to speak up when they see any actions of uh, racism or any verbal assaults. And so we all need to be working together at this time to make Amherst a good place for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, are there any other comments from counselors at this time? Okay, then uh, motion for this resolution is to adopt the resolution denouncing xenophobia and discrimination against Asians and Ameri Asian Americans as presented. Is there a second? I Ryan, second. second. Okay. We'll put George a second on that. And I'm going to begin with Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Kelly Balmilm. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Patty Angels. Yes. Darcy Dumont? Yes. And Grace Murray is yes. So the vote is 12 0 0 with one absent. Thank you very much, Tracy, and have a good evening. Thank you.
are going to move on to Mr. Bachelman and the financial people uh, and the budget presentation. I think I've been kicked off the Zoom here. <laughs> You're still right. here. I just see the word Zoom in front of me. I don't see you. What to, do I press uh, it down and click on the camera? Click on the camera. Okay. Okay, thank you. I learned something. Very good. All right, Paul. Hi. Um, I think Sean is going to run our budget um, presentation for you for us. And joining us tonight are Sean Magana, the finance director, and Sonia Aldridge, our comptroller. And as you know, nothing gets done without those folks working on it. And I want to also call out specifically Holly Bowser, the assistant comptroller, who put an enormous amount of work into it and support from a lot of other people, every department head, uh, and Brianna Sunred, who helped put this together. So um, we have a bit of a presentation, not a lot of detail, but I do want to just put it in context. So when we started our budget process back in you know, October, November, things were going well. As you all know, we, it was really a positive note. Um, and then we had the, um, and the council had um, established budget guidelines for us. We were operating within those guidelines, building our budget. And then COVID-19 hit and just threw everything up in the air. Um, it's almost, you know, preparing a budget is always an arduous process and it's something that we put a lot of work in because it's an important document. I want to emphasize it's a planning document. It's what we know now and how it's going to guide our decisions going forward. It is a, it's, it's not set in stone because it's something that we will come back to, but we can't really, but it's, again, it's a planning document where we think the money's going to come from and where we think it should go during the coming year. Um, so uh, the, and I think this year, um, the council passed two sets of budget policy guidelines. And I think this year, um, we've never appreciated them more. We've really gone back to them many times. We appreciated the sort of care and detail that the budget policy guidelines gave to us uh, because a lot of thought went into it by the finance committee and the council. And they really um, covered a lot of the issues that we were, that we were uh, dealing with. Um, and it was important for us to know where the council stood. And so again, sort of reemphasize the importance of those budget policy guidelines. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So when we talk about the, the Amherst municipal uh, budget, we really are talking about five different budgets. Uh, we have the municipal budget, which is the five, which includes four enterprise funds, which we, which is the um, water, sewer, solid waste, which is the transfer station in essence and transportation. We have the elementary school budget. We have the library budget. We have the regional school budget. And we have the capital improvement program. Those are the five elements of our budget that we, um, that we present tonight. Uh, we, will, we are focusing on our municipal budget because that's the one that you have not seen in details yet. Um, next. So this, um, I want to give you the highlights of what, what we're talking about. This, this is sort of the top line. We, our budget for FY21 is $81,333,439. That's a reduction of 2.8% or $2.3 plus million. And that's lower than it was in FY20. So those are real dollars. Um, it's not it's not, we didn't increase it and then reduce it, and which is what some people do. Uh, this is like $2.3 million lower than we had last year. Um, what the directions from the council was to level fund our operating budgets, which we have done. We've cut the spending for capital in OPEB. OPEB is other post-employment benefits, which is um, health insurance for retirees. And over time, the town has been very diligent about putting money aside into the OPEB fund. We will continue to do that, but just not at the scale that we had anticipated doing this year. And the budget includes the elimination of three full-time equivalent benefited municipal positions and several part-time positions. So these are positions that were on the books. Um, they're vacant. We're not going to fill them. And it was it's one way that we are meeting the needs of this budget. And importantly, we're committing $80,000 to explore plan, explore, explore plan and implement strategies 
to confront systemic, structural, institutional racism. And I want to mention that here because it's really important, and I'll mention it again later. If you go to look for that in the budget, it, there's not a specific line item in the budget. We did not want to put it in any one department's budget because it's important for us to listen and hear what people feel this money should go to. And so we have it reserved uh, in a separate line item. But again, I didn't want to really take the make the effort to put it into a not the effort, but the make the decision to put it into a particular department until we had full engaged conversation with the broader community. So the next slide. So Sean is gonna take over for a little bit. So we're just gonna do a little tag team action here. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, so I'm gonna do a brief introduction, um, talk a little bit about the impact COVID-19 has had on the budget. Um, turn it back to Paul for a little bit, talk about budget guidelines. We'll get into the revenues and expenses, uh, reductions and in new investments, a little bit on uh, some of our long range planning, and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions. So the town of Amherst has had a long history of prudent planning and strategic thinking um, by its financial leaders in particular, but by many of its leaders. And that has put us in a very solid financial position to start this year. Um, our reserves uh, entering FY20 were F, uh, about 15 million, about 15.8 million, um, which is roughly 19% of the budget. Um, and we're anticipating at this point that we'll be able to add to that those reserves at the end of FY20 as well. Um, because we were in a solid financial position to start FY20, uh, we were able to put forward a FY21 budget that maintains core services, um, and in particular, a level funds operating budgets, uh, despite the economic downturn that we all know about. And by maintaining core services, we're able to continue doing long range planning and in particular preparing for some of the large capital projects and other challenges uh, that the town is gonna face in the coming years. So this year was a little bit um, unique on the revenue side. We've had to really look at the different revenue streams that we've relied upon in the past. And so you'll see that first section says rebalanced use of existing revenue streams. And that's because we have had a pretty uh, significant change in, the, in, the, in our sources. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a few slides, but we're gonna see our, our local receipt portion of our revenue uh, budget go down, um, which means the other portions of the budget have to make up the difference. Um, we've put forward a plan for using reserves only if state aid is reduced and the, the strategic thinking behind that was to allow us to move the budget forward because um, we still wouldn't know what was going on with state aid if we hadn't made that decision. Um, so making that decision allowed us to, to do what we're doing tonight and put forward a, a full budget. There's no request for an operating budget override. We are utilizing external funding sources to the fullest extent to address the impacts of COVID-19. So we received some money from the state, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and we've already started receiving some reimbursements from the state for our expenses related to COVID-19. And also later we'll get into our budgeted reductions, but we've targeted them on areas of the budget that have seen a, a decrease in service related to COVID-19 or uh, in vacant positions. So more on COVID-19. So it, can, it has had and continues to have a negative impact on both the revenues and expenditures in our town. Um, in particular, it has really impacted our local receipts, which we'll get into some of the detail behind that. This budget assumes, um, is really sort of line by line, assumes different things for different local receipt lines. So some of those line items we projected an entire year of, of depressed revenues. Uh, some of those line items, maybe half the year, and we, we project it coming back. Um, but we really thought about each one of the different uh, accounts that make up our local receipt, um, our local receipt revenues, and you know, projected to the best of our knowledge what we think it's going to do for this coming year. Um, but because it is a projection, it, that's one of the areas that we'll have to monitor every month to see how our projections are doing against what's actually happening. And as I said before, there is very little information on state aid at this point. Um, we do know that the state has elected to go with a one month budget. And what I've heard recently is that there'll probably be at least one more one month budget from the state because there 
waiting for some information that's going to come out in mid to late July, and that will help drive their full budget uh, discussions. So we don't anticipate any news on state aid anytime soon. So this uh, Amherst was allocated $3.4 million from the CARES Act to cover uh, eligible expenses related to COVID-19. Um, we have already submitted our first request, uh, which was about $600,000, and we received the, the CARES Act portion of that, which was a little over $300,000. Um, we, as of right now, those funds can only be used for eligible expenditures. It can't be used to replace lost revenue. Um, but we want to be careful in using those funds moving forward. We want to use them wherever there are needs. But there has been discussions about the, the eligibility potentially changing for those funds so that they can make up for any revenue losses that we're seeing in town. Um, another impact of COVID-19 is just the decisions that, are, that have been made and will be made in the future by the colleges and university. Um, those decisions will impact our revenues and expenditures. And so we have to uh, stay in tune there. And an important thing for us all to do and to remember um, is, is during this time that we, we need to try to become more efficient and some of the things we're already doing um, with technology and you'll hear about a, a budget addition later on um, that's about increasing efficiency and so that when the economy does rebound, the town will be stronger for it and we'll be in a, a strong position to address the future challenges in the town. And I'm gonna turn it back to Paul to yep. talk a little bit about the budget guidelines. So as I said, the town council had adopted budget guidelines back in December, which, which we used as our baseline for as we were starting to build our budget. And at that point, the council said that the quote was the services that are provided are important for residents and businesses and a budget must allow for their continuation. So that told us that to keep the ship going straight forward, there are other initiatives that the council would like to see and, and financial things to keep us steady. And then post COVID-19, uh, with the revised um, budget guidelines, um, the, you know, one of the things about the, the budget guidelines is they were really good about recognizing the um, nuances of our budget. And it said, we need to be creative and remain flexible as the future unfolds. But this year, the goal is to maintain our current initiatives to the greatest possible extent, adjusting as needed for the reasons that have been stated. Um, so I, I think this 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 again the budget message was pretty clear keep things going as best we can but we understand that things will need to be changed or adjusted and i think that's where we are today so the next slide so the major things that we're looking at is we sought to fund the operating budgets at the fy20 level that was the directive that went to the schools the library and to all into our town side of of, of things um First, make sure that we are funding all of our legally required obligations, such as debt service, assessments, um, contractual obligations, things like that. We had to meet those needs first. Um, the, the, um, the May guidelines recognize that if we were going to reduce something, it was the one-time expenses, the cash capital that we were reducing, and we cut that in half, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, because that's something that if, things turned around is something we could, you know, if we, if we decide not to buy a truck today, um, we can come back and buy that truck. If we lay somebody off today because of budget reductions, it's really hard to bring that person back. And there's a lot of expenses that come off when you redo a reduction in force. And the other thing that we did was um, reduce the town's contribution to the OPEB trust fund by 50%. And I mentioned that before. And you know we do have concerns that about whether that will impact our bond rating, which is something that's been really important for us as we have such a, a good bond rating and we want to make a better bond rating. But we're seeing every lots of communities taking these types of steps. The fact that we continue to make a contribution during this time, I think is a really positive indicator for us. Next slide. So I think you're doing this one, Sean, right? Yep. So thanks, Paul. Um, so we're going to get into the revenues. So this is just a pie chart of the different um, revenue sources that support the budget. And as I mentioned, the balance of these different sources has changed a little bit. So property tax has remained stable, um, but you'll see uh, local receipts are, have declined, and we'll get into the specifics of how much they've declined. And state aid is really an unknown. So we've level funded it. Um, or, or yeah, level funded it for 
uh, FY21 budget and the, the one month budget that the state has put forward, level funds, state aid at FY20 levels as well. Um, but that's something that we're gonna stay closely in tune with. Um, and then the other, the fourth funding source that hasn't changed too much is the other um, section up above. So getting into a little bit more detail, um, property taxes, uh, we're projecting an increase of 3.4%. That is the, the baseline 2.5% increase plus new growth. Uh, we have lowered our estimate of new growth. So this 3.4% is a little lower than in past years. Um, we've worked with the assessor's office to get an estimate of what would be sort of a bare minimum ba uh, uh, conservative estimate of new growth given the, the economic circumstances. And so that's the number we've moved forward with. Um, so we, we have factored in the economy into this, into this number. Uh, local receipts are decreasing 37.3%, and that includes reductions in many areas, but um, a few that I'll note here are excise taxes, meals tax, rental revenue, departmental receipts, licenses and permits, fines, investment income, and then again, a variety of other revenues. And state aid is flat, but we have a high level of uncertainty there. So in total, the general fund revenues are project, projected to go down 2.8%, which is the, the 2,339,045 uh, figure that Mr. Bachman noted before. So getting into the numbers a little bit more in, in local receipts. So these are some of the noteworthy reductions, um, a 26% reduction estimated for motor vehicle excise revenues, a 75% reduction for hotel, motel, and meals and excise taxes, 67% reduction in rental, uh, rentals of the bank center and other rental properties, 73% uh, reduction in departmental revenues. And in this area, the budget includes leisure service programs, um, at Cherry Hill and recreation camps, and 37% reduction in licenses and permits. And again, we thought about each of these and thought about conservatively what next year could look like, um, depending on um, if, if we continue to handle COVID-19 well and the economy continues to improve, but also the, the flip side of that, if something goes wrong, and um, like we've seen in some other states, if things start to go the other way, we want it to be um, in a conservative place with our revenue estimates. So the other portion of the budget that did have some, or the revenue budget that did have some changes is that other area. Um, so there were a couple of reductions there. The ambulance fund, which um, last year saw a loss in revenue because of the town of Hadley going a different direction with its um, ambulance services, um, is also seeing an, another reduction in receipts this year because of the, uh, the students at the colleges and university going home. So there's just fewer calls and, and that's led to lower revenues for the ambulance fund and that supports the overall budget. And then the enterprise fund reimbursements um, or indirect costs are down 251,000 and that's also due to COVID-19 related reductions in services. Um, in particular, the, the sewer fund and the consumption being down also due to the, the students going home at the college and university. Um, and also then uh, transportation fund and the impact on parking revenues that have come into the transportation fund going down. So on the enterprise fund front of revenues, uh, we're projecting a 2.12% decrease in water revenues. We're projecting a 7.2% decrease in sewer fund revenues, a 21.8% decrease in transportation revenues, um, and the one silver lining is a 4.2% increase in solid waste. Um, and that's due to some uh, revenue generating activities that are a little bit newer that they're going to try to implement next year. Um, as we'll talk about later, water and sewer rates uh, we're proposing to increase, but they're still below the state average in most of our neighboring communities. Uh, there is a reduction in consumption in the water and sewer enterprise fund and that ha due to fewer students on campuses and that has lowered our revenue projections. And then just the business downturn uh, when businesses were closed and now when they're kind of opening up slowly, um, seeing less demand in, in the center of town and around town for parking. So switching over to the expenditure side. So that was where the money comes from and this is where the money goes. So you'll see the three biggest slices of the pie are the town, the elementary schools and the Amherst Pelham Regional School District. 
um, a few of the smaller slices are for the Jones Library, capital, um, unappropriated uses, which are uh, uh, cherry sheet items, and miscellaneous, which is our retirement assessment and OPEB and uh, one other line item there. So the guidance was to, to level fund and essentially that's what happened here. There was a, a small overall increase because of the um, complicated mechanism we have for the charter and choice reimbursements to the elementary school budget where there's always a, a lag and um, it kind of creates this weird adjustment that the elementary schools always get. Um, but the regional schools came in under guidance and so it sort of netted out that, that mechanic. Um, so essentially it is a level funded budget for all four um, areas. In capital, that's where we saw one of the biggest reductions of 40.5%. Um, we're gonna talk about the capital improvement program later. You know, the goal was to get to 10% of the tax levy and, and before COVID-19 uh, hit us, we were planning on being at 10%, but after that, after the impact, we had to drop it down to 5%. Um, so there's a big reduction here. Uh, retirement OPEB is going up 1.1%. That is our retirement assessment going up about $300,000. Um, and that's being offset by the reduction to the to OPEB contributions that Mr. Bachelman noted before. And then assessment and other, which are, are cherry sheet items, um, is going down 2.4%. And so on the expense side, just like the revenue side, uh, the total uh, budget is 81333439 which is a, a reduction of 2.8%. And I'm gonna turn it back to Mr. Bachelman to talk about the budget reductions and investments. So we talked a little bit about um, what we've done to help get within that um, level funded budget. So I mentioned that there were three positions, three FTE positions uh, that we have taken away. Um, they're not in the budget this year. One is the budget analyst, one is an assistant to the assessor. Um, the, an LSSC program director and the conservation administrative assistant. These are all positions that are vacant at this moment. We did not uh, have not conducted a search and we will not be filling them going forward. Um, what's happening to them? Well, for budget an analysts, we have our Shan Sean Mangano here who's taking on additional work to make sure all the work gets done. Um, assistant to the assessor, we have a new assessor and we're waiting for her to do an assessment of what the needs of that department are. Um, LSSC program director, the work is just getting distributed to other people on LSSE and the conservation administrative assistant. Uh, this is work that's being divided up, but for, you know, for all practicality, um, our, the staff of the town manager's office, uh, Angela Mills specifically is taking on additional duties to support the assistant town manager in this end. Um, there's some temporary staffing that we're not hiring this year at Cherry Hill. Uh, outdoor pool operations. Uh, there are two hourly positions that used to help out in the town clerk's office. These are things that we've eliminated this year. Um, and they're, they're things that are seasonal typically and or for activities that we're not doing or we're using um, LSSC full-time employees and we're reallocating them to take on other duties as assigned uh, to fill in for Cherry Hill operations. Um, just so you know, for Cherry Hill, we have hired no part-time employees. We have someone from the finance department up there. We have someone from the senior center working at Puffers. Um, we have uh, people from LSSEE. We have parking enforcement officers all sort of being reallocated to where the need is so we don't have to hire uh, part-time or temporary employees uh, this year. Next slide. So we've also um, had some savings in uh, lowering our costs on property and casualty insurance. Um, we have a lower cost for OPEB actuarial studies. Um, one good thing that happened is that Maya, our new health insurance uh, company has said that they would give us a premium holiday, which means because people weren't using hospitals that much uh, during COVID, they experienced the revenue kept coming into them through our, our payments for our premiums, uh, but they weren't spending money out. So they realized quickly that there was money to be, that they should return the money to cities and towns, which is they have done. Uh, we are looking at doing this, uh, I think in October or sometime like that. It will be shared uh, in equivalently between um, employees who put money in and the town. And uh, this is one 
good news story for us as well. Um, and then we had some money set aside for transitional staffing, which is what we've been trying to do when there's a, a vacancy. We try to have a little bit of overlap before that person retires, for instance, and we're taking that away. Um, the third one is veterans benefits. So we're not reducing any veterans benefits at all. Every veteran who's entitled to veterans benefits will continue to get veterans benefits. These are benefits that are paid. Um, I think we pay 25% for the town, 75% by the state. Um, but we looked at our past usage um, for veterans benefits and realized that we never got to where um, those veterans benefits were. So we felt we could reduce that uh, um, and be, still be within a comfortable range and make sure we met every veteran's needs. And there were some other things with Cherry Hill because we aren't opening this, the, um, the, the place up there. We're not buying stuff to sell or anything like that. Clubhouse. Clubhouse, thank you. I don't, I don't golf, Sean does, so. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a number of things that, um, you know, you don't do this without saying, well, what is this all magical? Is it, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't getting done. So again, we talked about two and a half million dollars in capital that we're not spending. And this is one of the ways that we're balancing the budget this year. Um, that means we're, we're either not buying or we delaying the request for vehicles uh, for police cruisers. We're not buying any police cruisers, no fire trucks, no ambulance, no trucks for schools, conservation, or DPW. Computers, facility repairs and improvements, all things that we typically put, put together. We asked, I wanted to put more money into roads and sidewalks, but uh, with JCPC, they wanted more money taken out, um, but we didn't. There's certain pro projects that are just not moving forward at this moment in time, North Common, the athletic fields, Puffers Pond, zoning revisions, all things that were going to require investment of town funds. Now these things haven't gone away. We have a pot of money that we are holding until the fall that the council will have the ability to, to appropriate at the right time once we have a better sense of where we are going forward. Um, the other things, um, Oh, the, the OPED funding delays, uh, we talked about that in sewer and transportation enterprise funds. Uh, the one thing I do want to mention is we talked about, we, we had such high hopes because we anticipated about $600,000 in additional revenue this year that we were going to invest in things. And that's that was where we were um, really uh, excited to be able to present to the council some new initiatives that's not going to happen. So those are things that had we had a normal year, we would have had a, the level funding plus another $600,000 and that's not going to be there this year. So as I mentioned, the $80,000, I think this is really the most important thing we're doing this year. Um, it's a sum of money that I am allocating or I request the council to allocate specifically to support work that we need to do as a town it's not just police department, but it is the police department. And it is not just town offices, it is town offices, but it's also a broader conversation. Um, and I don't know exactly what that will buy, but I think that looking at other communities that are doing something like this, um, larger community, communities typically, uh, we're about in the range of what, what they're setting aside. And again, this is one of those things where I feel it's really important to listen and hear what the need is and where, where that I know that the change doesn't come easy, but it also isn't cheap. You need to have money to support these activities. Um, we are investing in additional um, uh, software uh, to streamline our application and permitting processes on the second floor and make sure that our, all of our licenses are up to date so we can continue to move, maintain our online presence, which is really important. We've recognized the, the value of that uh, during this COVID-19 shutdown. Um, and we wish we had the, the online permitting up right now, but we will have it really soon. It's, it's, we're, we're working towards making that happen. Um, liability insurance, there are times, um, we can talk more about this in the finance committee, uh, when you need to have, we had gaps of coverage that were signed, scary to me, come from the insurance world. We were self-insured on some things. I felt that was not a good place for the town to be, especially in a down economy. So we're dedicating some funds to plug those holes. And then there's a small amount of money uh, for to make sure that council can have um, real secretaries that can record their minutes for them uh, for you. 
All right. As I mentioned earlier, we are um, doing a lot of long range planning right now because there's so many variables and, and the uh, range of what reality could look like a year or two years from now is pretty wide. Um, we're, you know, there's many variables to consider like our state and local economies, which will impact us in a variety of variety of ways. Um, our state aid, but also federal aid, you know, 10 years ago when we had a recession, there were, was a big chunk of money that came um, in particular to the schools. So I know that that world a little bit. And, you know, so there's still potential that more funding could come from the federal side, but um, it's a big unknown at this point. Uh, the, the operations of local colleges and the university, uh, what are some of the short term changes that they're implementing and, and are any of those going to turn into long term changes and what does that mean um, for the town going forward. And so, you know, all these variables have led us to, you know, strongly believe that the impact is going to extend beyond FY21 from COVID-19 um, and possibly beyond FY22 as well. So we have to be prepared for a range of different economic impacts moving forward. Um, and, and so we'll be monitoring the budget on a monthly basis and uh, planning for multiple scenarios going forward. And so now we're going to talk about what's next or what we're going to, what's going to happen moving forward. So um, tonight we're obviously doing the presentation and hopefully the budget will get referred to finance committee. Um, tomorrow the finance committee will start a very uh, strenuous uh, string of meetings start over the next couple of weeks, um, reviewing the different components of the budget. Um, and so some, I won't go through all the, the different meeting dates, but tomorrow will be the sort of general overview of the budget um, and then a focus on the elementary schools and the library. Um, after the finance committee has reviewed and met with the different departments and discussed the budgets, the, their part of the budget, um, there will be a public hearing which is on Monday, July 13th, 2020. And then the following day, the finance committee will vote on a recommendation of the FY21 budget. And then a week, um, or actually the, the following Monday after that, which is a Tuesday, or the following Monday is the 20th, um, the council will then vote, if everything goes according to plan, we'll vote in on the uh, FY21 budget. Just one note on that, Sean. Um, yep. We've had a request to move community services off of the July 2nd meeting date to another date, probably July 9th. So once we confirm that, we will update the calendars and check with the finance committee chair if that's doable for him. Perfect. All right, Paul, I will hand it back to you on how to get more information. Sure. So um, there's a lot of information. Don't expect you to absorb it all. We have a 200 plus page document that's on our, on our website now. Uh, there's a budget message that's on our website as well. Um, all the charts, the information is available, everything is there. Um, and um, we want people to, to review it. There's different ways you can communicate back. You can email us, you can go to the website, www.amherstma.gov slash budget. We're doing a couple new things this year um, to try to en enlist people. And um, we do our normal Thursday call-in show on, at noon on Thursday, July 2nd, the superintendent of schools will be part of, of that con conversation to talk about the school's budget and or anything else that you want to talk about. So these are just, it's a Zoom meeting, it's a standard thing, it's on our website, people can plug in and we record them so you can watch that at any time that you'd like. And um, this is a news flash to, to Sean, uh, inviting him to be on Ju July 9th um, to make sure that um, if there are other questions about the budget, we want these two um, sessions that are open to the public. Anybody can call in, can participate uh, to be there. We're doing something really creative. I've only know one other town that has done this uh, and what they call an AMA, ask me anything. And our new finance director is brave enough to open himself up to this, um, where on July 9th, he will be available for 24 hours. You can you know, send in any questions and he'll turn it around. Um, I'm not sure 24 hours exactly, but um, He'll be able to answer your questions for you and it just gives people an opportunity to post questions um, he'll post answers all the questions and answers will be available online and we'll feed that out through reddit which is the, the normal hosting platform for an ama and facebook and twitter things like that so another way to try to engage people um, where they are versus saying come to me um, and then of course there is on the budget page there is a form that you if you want to provide budget budget feedback and we actually do get budget feedback questions. We'll share those with the council when they come in as well. And Paul, real quick on the AMA, 
if you submit a question between one in the morning and five in the morning, don't expect a very quick response. We'll get, we'll get to it as fast as we can, but. And I just want to, you know, again, thank everybody. We, you know, we have superb um, cooperation and relationship with the school superintendent and the library director and um, high level communication with, with the finance committee on the council. So we thank everybody for their work on that. Um, this is, as Sean said, it's going to be an arduous few weeks for the council, especially the finance committee. Um, by, but I think it's a really important conversation to have and we're really interested in your questions. Okay. First of all, thank you. And um, mention again that the budget is available on the town website and uh, a few people did ask and did receive their hard copy. Um, reminding people that the town council finance committee will be meeting every Tuesday and Thursday for the next two weeks. And all counselors are welcome to those meetings as well. Um, we will make sure that you have an opportunity to ask questions um, during that time period as well. But for the time being, are there questions from the council at this time? Alyssa. Thank you. I um, had three things and they can all be, you know, answered at some point in the future, not today. One, I'm looking at the paper copy of the budget. I keep flipping back and forth and the paper copy of the budget and then the slides we just saw that had the really great little things that say, you know, $12,000 for minutes taking, three FTEs. I don't see that information in chart form anywhere in this gigantic dead tree. So I see it explained in text in a couple of different places, but I think that would be really helpful to us to be able to refer back to that um, in terms of the increases, reductions, and reallocations. Again, it's in text, for example, on page four, but there's not a chart of those things like there was in the slides. So that's just one for future reference. And then the other, in terms of answering a question, is on page nine, the positions and full-time equivalents. I'm sure there's a really good reason. The math is only down 1.48, even though it's three. Paul knows exactly what I'm asking about. So maybe something that just says, the reason these two numbers are like this is just because that's how it always works. And that's fine. And then, um, because especially since that one's in a chart format, people are gonna climb onto that and not notice the um, other positions we didn't fill, all of which we thought were important and were ser providing services to people, but we've had to make adjustments. And then the final thing is if you could let us know later on in the process, something I've been trying to not ask about for a long time now, but I finally feel compelled to, under local receipts, we have it broken out for motor vehicle excise. We have hotel, motel, and meals excise, although we've always asked that our quarterly reports actually separate hotel, motel, and meals because they don't always track directly. And so that's not broken out here. This is only the broad category. But more importantly, there's nothing in that I can find, and I'm just saying it's somewhere in here, is there's nothing in here about marijuana slash cannabis excise, which we receive on recreational slash adult use. We have had gotten some money from that, and so um, we should know where that is being kept. And then also the host community agreement payments from both medical and recreational adult use. We should know where that money is kept. I understand that our town is very loath to have separate accounts for things. Other communities sometimes do, do that. But if you can just give us a piece of paper later that says where that money is and how we can track it, because I don't see any ability to do that right now. So, and people have asked me about it as well as myself wondering based on my work on that. So thanks for your help. Okay, are there other questions from the council? Mindy Jo. Yes, thank you. I haven't had time to review the whole thing yet. Um, so I will do that over the next few days and probably get questions to you. Um, a couple of things that stood out to me just initially um, is the sewer fund revenues decrease is a whole lot larger percentage wise than the water fund, yet I would think they would somewhat track. Um, so it'd be, in, it'd be good to know why you're expecting one to be a whole lot percentage wise <laughs> lower than the other. Um, I, this was touched on a little bit. The school budget was not level funded. Um, even if you take regional was 40,000 lower, elementary school was 73,000 higher, that's still a $33,000 difference. So an explanation as to why that is not a level funding 
um, a little bit better explanation as to why that might not be. Sounds like you, you touched on that with charter school reimbursements, but if that could be explained a little bit more so that we know that it is within our um, budget guidelines, even though it doesn't appear to be within the budget guidelines. And then I, I still, I just wanna put out there that I am still really concerned that we are planning for level funding from the state. And I know that's something we can't do anything about right now because we have no idea what the state is doing, but I am concerned that it will affect our reserves tremendously and that it's not something that's sustainable beyond one year. Um, we might be able to do that if, if it comes in really low for a year, but um, it's not really sustainable beyond that. And so somewhere addressing what that might look like if it comes in 15, 20% lower um, and what that means for mid-year changes potentially if we don't wanna tap into our reserves, but also what that means for next fiscal year and how we would have to adjust for that and what that effect might be um, would be something I think I, I'm not on finance, but I think finance should be looking at and planning for. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I, I just build on what Mandy just said, because that's the other thing that it struck me in when we were on uh, JCPC looking at what we had to do with the capital budget that next year, the next fiscal year is may even be tougher because of what we had to do this year. So sooner rather than later having, Sean, you said you're gonna have some alternative scenarios. You also mentioned that when you completely close the current fiscal year, there may be some excess um, and looking at what that money is and whether that goes back into reserves, whether it goes into capital spending, sort of the timing of when we would make those decisions. And I, um, it won't be something that comes up directly in finance, but we have some places where we've tapped into reserves. So the purchase of Hickory Ridge a golf course that as far as I know, hasn't completely gone through yet, unless someone had, um, when or when would we, or would we potentially say this isn't gonna go through and the amount that was set aside out of reserves to enable that um, gets freed up. So I, I just think we need to be thinking of um, where do we potentially have money if uh, the, the state does things, um, even in our worst case scenario, it was a big, you know, you had a worse, worst case, but you were doing a possible worse. So just thinking through those, then um, Alyssa picked up a couple small, I won't call them small, but um, I really like the places where you have trends. And in one case, you're showing state aid going back as a share of the budget to 2002, FY01. But then in the dollar one, you only do it to, to 2010. So I think telling the story back 20 years, um, I found it very helpful to have those kinds of numbers when I was talking to people about why their property tax dollars don't buy them as much as they used to, you know, to be able to say, because we used to get more state aid and now we're more dependent on property taxes. So just thinking in terms of those longer term trends are sometimes extremely useful. And I'm gonna be saying that tomorrow on the schools, Sean. I just think trying to understand what has happened to enrollment, but also staffing from the time when my kids were going through to now. Um, so, so as background information, when we're looking at the current year budget, I just think they're extremely useful, you know, just as, you know, whether they're in an appendix or wherever. Are there other questions or comments from the council? Okay, then uh, I would like to thank Paul and Sean and Sonia and all of the staff that worked on this. I know that putting together a missive like a budget is not exactly small work. And uh, it's now already in the hands of the, of the uh, finance committee. 
because we already voted to refer it. So um, we have our work cut out for us, Andy, and uh, we look forward to uh, meeting with all of you. Um, so we are going to go on very quickly, uh, I hope, to the town manager evaluation update. And uh, this was referred to GOL. And I personally want to thank the council for doing that. Uh, because uh, I think their comments were incredibly valuable and uh, it led to some changes that we'll talk about briefly. So, uh, Serge, can you increase the size of that? For those of us that are already ready wearing bifocals, thank you. Okay, so this is the timeline that you've seen before, it, and it's been updated, and you'll notice that it says note one, two, note three, note four. Don't worry about five, six, seven, and eight, but note one, two, three, and four are the things that are in your packet tonight. The first of those is the town manager's evaluation that we're proposing to use. The second is the email that we uh, would be sending to staff and how we're going to be doing that. The third is the email to chair committee, committee chairs, et cetera. And the fourth is public notice. Um, the group of the GOL also did talk about goal setting and uh, a variety of other kinds of things. Um, George, do you have anything particular you want to mention from GOL? I think it's probably going to be most useful to get right into the changes that were made, especially on the town manager form. Um, so I think, no, I don't want to add anything. Um, we, we need to get into the specifics. Okay. We did discuss the timeline, it's tight, but to have to do anything else is basically just shoving it later into the year and that doesn't work either. So uh, just turning to the note one, which is the town council members, it's a, a memo to you and then it covers the background. So we struck a compromise. Last year, you'll remember, we asked you to rate every little item. This year, we're not. We're asking you to rate the overall goal and any act, uh, capital letters, like in this case, A. So let's go to the next page because I think it gives people an example. So here we're asking you to rate B and C. And at the end, we're asking you to comment on the whole area using as a guideline the subcategories under each of the A, B, and C. And also ask that you include thinking about how this particular thing has been affected by COVID. So as an example, finance is the one that is, has the most detail in it. So if you go to the next page, which is climate action, you actually rate on all five areas, and but you only write comments for one for the whole thing. You don't write comments for each. Okay. And then so on. And it continues through all of these. So it's a change. It means there's not as many um, tallies and, but at the same time, it also gives an opportunity for more comment. Um, and we, GOL, I actually went first to GOL with only having each broad goal rated. And the suggestion was made at the meeting to rate the A, B, Cs, and so forth. And it because it felt that it gave the town manager and the council more detail on how to think about the work that's been done or not been able to be done. Okay. Are there questions about this particular form? Yes, Alyssa. I'm sorry, I may be overlooking it in the packet, but without comparing it directly to the actual goals document that we put out, I'm, I'm trying to understand, I understood the words you said, but I'm trying to understand the rationale behind why some things were rating a heading and not the things that are underneath it, and other things were rating the things that are underneath it. I'm just not seeing what just... the rationale was behind that. So the goal is to not have as many things where you actually write them, okay? So what we chose to do was come up with rating all seven goals, 
okay? And then under the seven goals, whenever there is a letter, A, B, C, D, E, also rate that, but don't rate the subcategories under that. But, but if, I, if I could just follow up, that's, that's not how we designed the goals. When we designed the goals, I don't think we were making decisions about which were the things we were rating or not. And so I, I can live with change. I'm just trying to understand that when we divided up the goals, we might have set up the goals differently if we knew that some things weren't actually going to be rated. I will mention that during the committee of the, of the group that did the goals this year that were brought to the council, we did talk about doing something that would be more rating at the higher level of the goal, maybe subcategories and comments, but not all of the categories like we've done in the past. So other people may wish to speak to that. Kathy, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, that, that, is what I think we were also, we discussed when we were creating the goals, but also when we presented them. And I just, I think um, if you can go back up, I thought when I looked at this, that we are in every instance rating the big bold. Um, so we're doing the bold and then we're doing the capital letter A. So we're treating goal number I the same as goal number Roman numeral two, correct? Is that correct? That's correct. Um, okay, so then my, one of my questions is, will the form we get this in um, um, allow, so on the actual rating, it's just a check mark. And then on the comment, will it allow us to write as many words as we want? So if we want to, for example, if there's, on this very first one, there's lots of sub pieces. So it may be that there's something that stood out to you as particularly good, but some areas for improvement. So you want to write more about it. Can we just create that space in a way that we're not limited? Um, you know, some we're, we're not going to have much we want to write on, um, but others you might want to say, here's an example of this, that just was looking for what's being thought of in terms of allowing us to convey why we gave commendable satisfaction needs improvement up above. Right. So that's exactly the purpose of the comments. And uh, let me just mention that I did uh, spend some time talking to a survey research expert. Uh, we explored the various options uh, for doing this, uh, including um, SurveyMonkey, which is what we used last year. We also discussed Qualtrics, which the town does not have a license to, um, and would cost additional money. We discussed also using Google, but not, uh, Google is not considered to be as secure as, um, the, as SurveyMonkey or Qualtrics. And the other alternative is we just do a paper document and then uh, when I receive them all, we have I have to conduct the tally using a um, Excel spreadsheet. You could also put it in Excel, but that doesn't save any time. Um, so my preference, unless I hear a resounding "please don't do that to us," is to stay with Survey Monkey. But I'm more than open to whatever uh, the wishes of the council. Survey Monkey does allow you to have unlimited words, Alyssa. So I'm sure I wrote a great deal about what the shortcomings were of SurveyMonkey last year, and maybe we can somewhat accommodate those this year. But one of the things was, is you couldn't flip back and forth very easily, and there were things that were repeated because there were just errors in terms of how it was set up. So I think a lot of it's going to depend on how the layout looks, right? Just how you set out certain sections, but yet you're reminding us what the subheadings are under those things. I think that the way that was laid out last time was, as I said at our last meeting, really difficult to follow. So if when you translate this, there has to be a way, if you're using SurveyMonkey, to have it be you know, these bold sections, and then these are the underneath things, but these are the only things we're rating. Because when I did it on my big computer last year, only like six things showed up, then I had to go to a whole nother page, some of which were repetitious, it was really messy. And so if somebody feels like they are gonna dig in and do it a different way this year, I'm fine with that. I'm just saying it 
didn't work very well last year for me. So I'm working with Angela to convert it to Survey Monkey, and she and I will do a test run to make sure that it is. And if it doesn't work that way, we'll just give it to you in a document like this. The main thing is you cannot give it back to me as a PDF because I need to be able to swipe words out of it and stuff like that in doing the summaries. Okay. And remember all counselors, your document, your individual uh, response is a public document and will be published. Are there other questions? Okay, then let's go on to note two. Note two is the staff survey. I realize I forgot to include the staff survey uh, in your document. Uh, you have to go into a different uh, note. Serge, thank you. Okay, so a couple things. First of all, uh, I'm going to do a video um, introducing this to people. People can click on a link. They've been doing a lot of this during COVID where they've been having all kinds of um, meetings and stuff like that. So it's very um, clear. I also, uh, I, I also did consult with the town human resource person and they in turn talked to the town attorney or the, the town, yeah, the town attorney. Um, in the past, we actually provided the council and then put in the manager's um, file, the individual responses instead of a compilation of them. So in other words, not a summary, but compile the individual this responses so that in no way can you identify an individual inter if you have like 30 or 40. As we talked about this, as I talked about this with some staff, they felt that that was one of the most inhibiting reasons why people didn't answer the survey. They felt they could be identified. And the other is they also feel that computers for some reason are not safe, even though they are, and that you can be identified based on your computer. So we're, the plan is to put paper out as well as the electronic possibility. And um, again, have people respond and then we will uh, compile them. An individual will compile them. Alyssa. Thank you. And I'm sorry to ask to speak again, but obviously I have a long history with this. And so I appreciate your indulgence. One of the thing, and we've talked many times about how we need to improve the staff uh, query. And I, and I appreciate all the work that went into that. One of the things I just want to point out, and I'm wondering how you're planning to deal with, and maybe that's the word compile instead of summary, is every year we get responses that say he, because it's always he, is absolutely terrible in these five areas. And then we get responses that say he is amazing in these same five areas. And they're clearly, you know, it's, it's the same areas. And they're saying, so how does that get compiled? How does that get reflected? Because it shouldn't just be five of this and four of that, but, but what's the theory, without seeing those individual pieces and getting a sense of what each person did, like are they a positive rater? Or are they a negative rater? Are they all over the place? That's We're wonderful. not gonna see any of that. What's, that. what's that actually mean to us then? Because if you just have people at each end of the spectrum, then what does that mean? Well, that, and that is what you lose by not having the individual uh, forms in front of you. Uh, it's a, it's a trade-off. It's, do you want more responses, which is what I've heard from people, and therefore guarantee people more a level of anonymity, or do you want to be able to see the individual responses? And then people feel that somehow or another, you are able to um, identify them. So it's a trade-off. What you will see is five people said this, four people said this, and three people said this. The other thing I want to point out, and I, and I mentioned this to the GOL committee, and that is the um, form that we are using has now been used consistently for at least nine years. It is time to come up with a better form and update it. But we're not doing that this year.
there are other comments. Okay, then we're going to go on to note three. Note three is actually the one that we do committee chairs and we ask them to make sure they get it to their committees. And then if they need help with that, we do everything we can to do that. Um, and in your packet, this one particularly had all of the counselors emails, but if you'll see that was a note that said eliminate that because we really want them to just send them to town council at amherstma.com dot gov, excuse me. Okay. All right. And then the final, is there any question on that one? All right. And then the final one is to the general public. And the only real change we made on note four Thanks, is we actually printed the goals in this because we felt that it was while we refer people to where they can see the goals and they can see more detail about the goals in this one we actually printed the goals. And again, um, this is pretty much the way we've done it in the past. Uh, what the Council will see is a um, compilation of the responses we get. And these are all written, uh, there's no, we don't provide a rating scale or anything else. And again, this is something that should be considered as we look at revisions in the future. Because people will tend to rate on a scale before they answer, uh, they, before they bother to write something. Is there any question on this? Yes, Darcy. Um. So we didn't get very good response on this last year. No, we didn't. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, am I muted? No. 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 Um, okay. I'm wondering um, how we can do better this time around as, as far as getting better responses. Also, I hear you saying that we're not going to see the individual responses like we did last year. All you'll see is the is a respondent X said this, respondent Y said this. You won't see any content analysis, which you didn't see last year. You'll basically see the full responses. We just won't send them to you. Actually, I'm sorry, you will see them because they'll be sent to you at, a lot of them will be sent to you at town council at amherstma.gov. So some, you will see some of them. And others will go to the town manager thing and and do it. But they actually, in this case, they send it to town council at amherstma.gov. So I'm I'm sorry to have misled you on that. You will actually be seeing these. And we'll be seeing the staff um, evaluations also. The staff compilation. We saw the individual staff last year. Uh, you saw a compilation for those that answered electronically, and then you got about 11 more because they were paper ones. And then we actually entered the paper ones so that you could see a compilation electronically. So do we do do we have an answer to the question about how we can do better outreach this year? Well, the staff thing is where we've made the biggest changes. Uh, that's where we're doing a taping. We're also doing a um, we're providing everybody with a paper document as well as an envelope uh, that they can either drop in the mail or drop to us. There are no markings on any of these. Uh, we're trying to give people an assurance that they can't be identified. Uh, and we're also trying to just get, encourage people to answer them. So that we are trying through a variety of different means to do, uh, to get more staff feedback. Dorothy, 
You have your hand up. Uh, this is just a note since you have the paper in front of you that um, we would need to divide, perhaps may need to make an additional goal for next year uh, having to do with um, climate um, um, in terms of efforts. Uh, I don't, I don't have the words, but uh, you know, the $80,000, which is going to try to be spent to at request from the community to create a, a better racial climate. Uh, clearly that shows that that is one of the goals uh, going forward that um, the town manager is working on. And so there's climate both within the um, workforce and the um, town council and in the town. I, I, I just, in other words, I'm saying, I think that there's a movement towards another goal that would be for next year. Right, and George and, and the committee have already set a date for beginning to discuss the goals for next year so that they can come forward um, as we've scheduled on the timeline that you saw earlier. Okay, Alyssa? Yeah, just quickly, if you could run through um, what we, who we're getting specific responses from again and who we're not, because I hear that we're not getting them from staff, we're getting a compilation. I'm not clear on the difference between public and committees and why some things would come to the town council address and one not. And I also just do want to put in a plug for the fact that the select board made a point of never using an electronic form for staff. That was a decision staff made to start using for themselves without any select board authorization. We didn't get a huge amount of paper either when we did it for years on paper, but we did do it on paper with the envelope, just like you're talking about for exactly the reasons we talked about. So maybe we'll get back up to the highs we had then, which still weren't very many, but I bet the video thing will help with that. When it comes to, so we're going back to what worked better before, so that's great. But the things that are coming to us at town council, that is the staff will be a compilation, so that won't be coming to that group except through you. But then the public comments and the committee comments are going to hand, be handled which way? I'm confused. I'm sorry, and I, I did mislead you. I was incorrect. Uh, the, both the committee uh, comments will come directly to the council, okay. and staff and the public comments will come directly to the council. Okay. Great. They are to address them to town council at amherstma.gov. Great. Okay. Kathy. You're making an effort on staff to make sure we protect um, confidentiality for committee members. If there have been any, I, I you know I'm I'm not even knowing whether there's been any friction with any committees. Would a committee member be able to uh, submit a response without us knowing which committee member that what that person was, or would they always have to be identified? We provide a mailing address as well, so that if they wanted to mail it and just say it was anonymous, they could do that. Okay. Are there other questions? Okay, then uh, we're going to begin this process tomorrow. And uh, what I'd like to do is suggest we take a five minute break. Um, so we're going on with the rest of our um, action items. And I just want to mention every one of these has been before the council at least once. So we've talked about them. They've been referred to committees and they've come back to the council. So I'm basically saying unless there's something really pressing, we may not need to spend a lot of time discussing any one of these, okay? The very first one is the temporary zoning amendment, Article 14. Um, Mandy Jo, would you please speak to this amendment? Yes, as I mentioned two weeks ago on June 15th, this is the follow-up to ensure that this is able, this amendment and this zoning bylaw, Article 14 is able to be in, um, in force for more than 60 days. Um, what we did two weeks ago uh, allows it to only be enforced for 60 days. So passing it today under the correct charter provision 210A allows it to 
be enforced for the full 180 days. So uh, just a reminder that the planning board, the, the planning board voted unanimously and the um, CRC voted unanimously to recommend this article be adopted. Uh, the plan is to adopt it with the 180 day count to begin as of the original adoption date of June 16th. That would take it to December 14th. 180 days is actually December 13th, which is a Sunday under our charter and general counting principles. Sundays move to Mondays for deadlines. So it would be in effect until December 14th um, if we pass it tonight. Uh, George, anything further from GOL? We met on June 3 and we voted 5-0, declared it clear, consistent, actionable. Okay. Is there any further discussion or questions at this time? Evan. I'm, I'm just confused about the motion that's on our motion sheet, which I'm not sure. I, I guess maybe what I need to do is hear the motion before I see if I actually have a question. Because the motion on our motion sheet doesn't make sense. Thank you. I agree with that. And uh, I'm going to ask Mandy Joe to make the motion, please. The motion is to adopt zoning bylaw article 14 temporary zoning as presented in accordance with charter section 2.10A. So the assumption being we pass it tonight, it goes into effect 14 days, and then we don't necessarily have to include in that motion that it going to effect uh, repeals the emergency measure that just happens automatically. So yeah, so we'll need a second, Lynn, from from that okay, motion. Is there a second? Okay. Is there a second? Oh, second. Okay. okay. So Thank yes. Last week, uh, two weeks ago, the motion for passing it under emergency provisions provided for the automatic repeal of that emergency one upon the passage of the identical provision under Section 210A, which is why the motion tonight does not include any actual rescission. It was included in the motion two weeks ago. Beautiful. Thank you for that elegant solution. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yes, Darcy. I just want to repeat that I, um, you know, I very much support the part of this provision that allows um, businesses to move, adapt and move out on to the, uh, to the street and sidewalk and so on, but I can't the part that allows new new businesses to be permitted without going through the planning board and I'm especially um, concerned about this um, continuing after the 180 days uh, or being extended uh, because someone thinks it's a good idea so I'm going to have to vote against it again okay are there any other comments at this time Okay, Mandy Jo, would you please read the motion again since it was not correct on the motion sheet? Sure. It is to adopt zoning bylaw article 14 temporary zoning as presented in accordance with charter section 2.10A. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Any other comments? Seeing none, we're going to move to a roll call vote and we're going to start with Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. No. Lynn Griesmer is yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. The vote is 11 4, 1 no, no abstentions, and one absent. We're moving on to the water and sewer rates. And these were presented to us. Um, 
Oh gosh. Um, back on, I guess two weeks ago, they've been to the finance committee and they've come back um, with a recommendation to proceed as they were presented. And we do have with us today, both Guilford and Amy, I believe, if there's any questions. Yes, Amy, hi, Amy. Dorothy, do you have questions? Yes, I, the motion as it reads is raising the, the rates just um, a small percentage this year. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But the, but the, speak to that. the rate sheet that I got um, had rates, had, had a series of increases into the future. So I was just kind of confused by that. We are only voting on this year. Okay, thank you. Mandy Jo? Yeah, my only question is, um, do we as a council need to direct the manager to investigate a new rate structure or is that going to happen? The report indicated that would have to start in September. Um, I definitely wanna see that follow up to the presentation we had earlier. Um, do we need to vote as a council to make that happen or do we know that it is happening? And um, we can talk about that, but uh, we did discuss it. And then we also mentioned that it's going to be a little bit of a unusual year to be trying to look at rates to look for a new model. Uh, perhaps uh, people feel that's not important um, uh, from a mathematical standpoint. Um, having, having a more regular year is very important in setting up models but that's not part of this motion, okay? Uh, so the, the answer would be if we want to direct the, the town manager to do that, we need to do that in a separate motion, okay? Dorothy, you have a question. I, I had forgotten to take my hand down, I'm sorry. You. Kathy, you have a question? Uh, no, I just want to build on what uh, Mandy uh, said that, and if you look forward out five years, uh, just so everyone knows what that rate structure is, it's more than a 40% increase in water and it's nearly a 50% increase in sewer. But the discussion of might we want to change the way we do rate setting, I think can be analyzed um, without having to say we're doing it next year. And I think we should be doing that to at least see what the impact would be of different um, types of rate structure. So I realize that is not what we're voting on right now, but I want to remind people that I think we left it that we would provide at least some options that we would like to see, and then it would be easier for to, to then get the analysis on it. And I would be happy to work on that. And I, I assume that that analysis, that looking at those options would go back to the finance committee and then come forward. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, yes, this is an unusual year, so you could just do it on, look at a full year, an earlier year, and it would be a pro forma kind of, if we had done this in FY18, or you could do something that's logical rather than when we're down on use and mixing um, to see what the impact is. Okay. Are there any questions about this year's rates and this motion, this Area. Okay, Andy, uh, would you, since this came to finance and is in the finance um, report, would you please provide the motion? Okay, uh, I'll start with the motion itself and then uh, uh, just really briefly speak to it initially and then if there are more questions, go from there. Motion is to adopt approval order 2110, an order setting water and sewer rates to be effective July 1, 2020, as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on page, pages nine of the Finance Committee report titled Town Council Finance Committee, uh, June 29, 2020. Is there a second? Dorothy is the second. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Then we're going to go ahead with the vote. Uh, we are starting with 
Evan Ross. Yes. Brian. Yes. Shane. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Belmail. Yes. Um, Brewer. Yes. D'Angelo. Yes. Dumont. Yes. Greasemers, yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Passes 12, zero, zero, one absent. Okay, is there any further discussion at this point or is it understood that the finance committee would come up with um, the kind of idea models of what we might, are, if you will, the parameters of what we would like modeled and then come back to the council? Is that Mandy Joe, you raised that particularly. That Dorothy. sounds good to me. Okay, thank you. Dorothy? Just because of the uh, comment uh, in the New York Times, which was an incomplete statement, uh, the, the rates are not just because of a drop in usage because of uh, college populations uh, movement, but also um, in, in recognition of use and of future plans to secure a good and strong water supply for the town of Amherst, which we're not just waiting until things break, but we're moving ahead uh, for the future. So that that is part of it. And the Times just had a just threw that in, I think, as a teaser. Right. Okay. Um, so we are going to then move on to the capital improvement program. We already did um, agree under the consent agenda to um, suspend town council rules of procedure 8.4. And so we are now moving to the capital program and Andy, this is finance committee as well. Okay, uh, so we're back to uh, the, just to get to where my motion sheet is, uh, to the next uh, appropriation transfer order as recommended um and uh it is the capital improvement program i think that we need to actually uh do two votes as i understand that we have to uh, have to move to suspend council town council rules of procedure rule 8.4 for the we already did that agenda mm -hmm. item. that we was passed the consent agenda okay. okay that was i'm sorry that wasn't the consent agenda then um in accordance with, uh, I move that in accordance with Charter Section 5.5C and in compliance with Charter Section 5.5A and 5.5B uh, separately consider. I'm trying now, I'm, now I'm lost as to whether we did that one. Uh, no, to, separately, to separately consider and act on the capital improvement program for fiscal year 2021. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Thank you. Any further questions? And then we're going to move to a roll call vote. George Ryan? Yes. Kath Shane? Yes. Steve Schreiber? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Shalini Baumel? Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Kathy Angelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. Okay, that's 12 0, 0, 1 absent. The next motion, Andy. Yes, um, to adopt appropriation and transfer order, FY, no. I move. No, I'm sorry. It's the next one in accordance with chap Charter Section 5.7. In accordance with, I move in accordance with Charter Section 5.7C to adopt the FY21 Capital Improvement Program in the document entitled FY21 Capital Improvement Program as presented. Okay, is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. 
and just a friendly amend it's chapter charter section 5.7 e um, yeah. at this point in the night i can see why it looks like a c is there any further discussion on this yes mandy joe i just want to indicate that I will be voting against this um, because I'm still concerned that capital res the split between the reserve and the roads and sidewalks um, is the wrong split um, and so both votes indicate what that split is and I don't think we're reserving enough for actual capital needs beyond roads and sidewalks for this year. Okay. Any further comment or question? And then we begin with Kathy Shane. Kathy? Did you not hear? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Steve Schreiber? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Allen? Yes. Liz Brewer? Alyssa Brewer? Too many windows open at once. Yes. <clears throat> Pat DeAngelis. No. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Johanneke. No. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. The vote is 10 in favor, two uh, were no. A zero abstain and one absent. Okay, we're moving on to uh, the transfer order. Andy? Yeah, finally we get to the transfer order. Right. I moved to I moved to adopt appropriation transfer order FY2105A in order appropriating funds for a portion of the town of Amherst capital program equipment buildings and facilities as recommended by the finance committee and shown on page eight of the finance committee report uh, titled town council finance committee, June 29, 2020. Okay, this requires a majority vote. Is there a second? I'll second it. How's that? Any further discussion? Um, if I may, just for a moment, uh, since we have the chart on the screen and this is where we've been building to, what um, is before you um, is the line that's facilities, um, is the um, roads and sidewalks number, um, except for the um, chapter 90, which is state uh, money that is made available. Um, and uh, the $62,000 was an additional amount that's available. Um, and uh, Sean can explain it if need be, but it's from um, a special fund because of uh, um, fees uh, paid from um, services like Uber. And um, the reserve amount is below and um, as was uh, referenced in uh, uh, Mandy's comments, um, and uh, Kathy can separately report on it as chair of JCPC. JCPC initially had a recommendation for um, a, a slightly higher, wasn't substantially higher amount to go into the reserves, and the recommendation that was from the manager that was then adopted by the finance committee um, was to um, have the maximum amount available for roads and sidewalks, particularly sidewalks this year, I understand is what is planned. Given the large um, unmet uh, need and the need to determine the amount that's available for that purpose early in the year so that um, uh, Mr. Mooring and his uh, and Mr. Skeels can um, go through the process that's needed to um, get contractors in place to do the necessary work. And uh, that um, that was why the recommendation was made to go to a slightly lower amount. We did have some discussion 
within the Finance Committee about that and um, uh, concluded after discussion to accept that recommendation because uh, the um, amount for the reserve um, is really for unknown purposes at this point and um, may or may not be needed. If there is a much larger request, and it's due to COVID, there might be other funds that become available. And um, there's also um, the ability, if there's a really substantial unmet need, that we could um, go to um, a request to use reserves for the purpose, but that we didn't, as a committee, conclude that that was sufficiently likely to diminish the amount that's available for immediate contracting for roads and sidewalks. Kathy, you have your hand up. I just want to add, um, as Mandy said, JCPC voted instead of a 50-50 split, we did a 45-55 split with 55 in reserves. And part of the reason, I think when it came to finance um, and also during JCPC, there is an expectation that we're going to close out FY our current year with some surplus. We won't know how much that is until probably end of August or September. And what I'm hoping um, when we look at this is that we can bring that reserve back up, um, particularly it's the reserve if we have a major systems failure and we're betting on systems not failing during the year. So I think we really need to be thinking that way. And the roads, because they have to contract right away at the beginning of the summer to get the work done, need the cash up front. So it's, it's a balancing act um, as when Sean originally presented the overall budget 1.4 million is down by more than 2 million of what we thought we were going to have to spend um, just a few months ago. So this is, uh, we're, we're in uncharted territory with even the notion of a reserve like this. This is the, this is unusual. Is there any other comment from the council? Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, we're going for the roll call vote, Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jalani Balmilm. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmers. Yes. Mandy Johanneke. No. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. The votes 11, 1, 0, and 1 absent. 11 for 1 against. We're moving on to the regional school budget. And there are three votes in this. And then we are going to be done with the votes for the night. Um, so, the regional school budget, the regional school debt, and the assessment method, and I think um, if you didn't all hear, uh, at least some did, that all th of the three other towns have met, they have approved the regional school budget and the assessment method, and so basically we are the last of the four to complete that process. Um, any other comment at this time? Mandy Jo. Yeah, I just want to again comment that it looks like this budget really depends on state aid being level or even increasing the way you look at the budget. And I'm not sure how practical that is. Um, and so I'm really concerned that we'll be faced with a school, regional school committee coming back to us for more money um, mid-year uh, because state aid might not be level funded or not. Um, and so I, I just, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, I'm, but that if things don't get level funded, I, at this point, I'm unlikely to support an increase in that funding. Um, you know, so I just wanted to put that out there because I'm not comfortable with a budget that 
essentially assumes increased state aid in this environment. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Um, the uh, state aid, I mean, this, this is a, uh, an issue that can come up each year. I, obviously, I understand that the anxiety level is slightly higher this year. The um, schools, um, the regional school district is the one that has to bear the responsibility if there is a change because um, in the state aid for um, the chapter 70, because that money goes directly uh, to the regional district as part of the regional district budget. Uh, that's why um, in part, the school district maintains the excess and deficiency fund, which is their reserves, which is explained in the finance committee report, because it gives um, the school district some flexibility to deal with changes on either side of its budget revenue or expenses. Uh, I have uh, in my years not had the experience of the uh, regional district ever coming back and asking for towns to do a supplemental budget. And it is such an onerous process because it involves multiple town meetings that uh, it's that, that the whole process is not structured in a way that is likely that um, in less of um, extraordinary situation for um, the ability to ask uh, three different select boards now to um, schedule special town meetings and for the towns to be able to redo their budgets and the uh, regional district um, understands that as it develops its budget. Well, Andy, I just, I, I actually would like to clarify the reason that we didn't run into this in 2008, 9, and 10 is because the state placed more money, more of a priority on education in those years and other things fell by the wayside. What we don't know is whether that will be the case this year. Do they, may they come back to us if they want to? Um. They could come back to us, uh, but they would have to go through the entire process that we've just been through all the way through because it would be an amendment of the budget that would require uh, votes in three town meetings as well as the council. And uh, uh, so it's a difficult process. I think you raised a very good point, And I think that it's one that's worth bearing in mind again for this year. Uh, in what was then a very difficult year in which there was um, substantial um, reductions that were happening, including what are known as 9C cuts, where we were getting mid-year cuts, the legislature was very protective of schools. And um, the uh, real difficulty on the, uh, cut, the 9C cuts and in the reductions in state aid for the 2010 year came through the unrestricted general government aid, not through the chapter 70 side. Thank you. I John, think your hand raised before you speak. I, I'd like to ask, what is the approximate amount of the reserves for the regional schools? Uh, it's 3.8% uh, of their operating budget, I believe, based and uh, which is close. They have a maximum that they can accrue of 5%, which is okay. different from cities and towns. Okay. Sean, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to um, quickly note the region did include a, a $300,000 placeholder in their budget for a state aid cut. Um, so, you know, the amount could be um, discussed, but they did include a placeholder for that. And then they have the reserves. And then they have the reserves, yeah. Okay, are there any other questions at this time? Okay, we have three different votes, so we'll just start down with the first one. Andy, do you wanna do these or do you want someone else to? No, I think that I can probably get through. I don't have to do preliminary motions after all. Uh, okay. I move to adopt appropriation and transfer order 2102 an order approving the Amherst 
Pelham Regional School District budget. And, and let me go back. I should go as we're on 21 uh, two on the screen. So I'm going to stay with that. So I, um, to adopt appropriation and transfer to 2102 in order appropriating the Amherst Pelham uh, Regional School District budget and appropriation and appropriating the Amherst Town of Amherst share of the budget assessment as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on page nine of the Finance Committee report titled Town Council Finance Committee June 29, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Ryan. Thank you. Any further discussion? Then we start with uh, Stein, Steinberg. Yes. Paul Milne. Yes. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. Yes. Dumont. Yes. Griesmers. Yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. King. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Vote passes 12 0 0 1 absent. Moving to the next. Uh, this one is particularly around the debt authorization. Andy. Yes, I'm going to make the motion that I need to speak to it very briefly. Uh, motion is to adopt approval order FY2103 in order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District Debt Authorization as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on page seven of the Finance Committee report titled Town Com Council Finance Committee, June 29, 2020. And I'm gonna second it. So Andy, go ahead. Okay, this is the one that is very peculiar because you see on the top of it, that says no vote required. I don't think that you're going to very often see orders that actually say that. And um, the reason is explained in the report, but in actuality, what happens with these um, with, with debt authorizations under um, our former form of government and in our three uh, partner communities in the regional district is that if the school committee proposes um, borrowing for capital amounts that um, select boards can um, in, in towns can uh, choose to place on the town meeting warrant um, and a disapproval. If there's no disapproval within a 60 day period, it is automatically approved. Um, in the practice in Amherst had been when we had a town meeting form of government, the select board just never placed it on the warrant. And um, then after 60 days, it was approved, which I believe is what has happened within the other three towns. Uh, because we're now in our new form of government, then the question has arisen as to whether we should uh, just act on it and make this affirmative motion and uh, it was suggested that we do so. Uh, the Finance Committee basically concluded that um, there's absolutely no reason not to do so, and it's good to make a statement to the region that um, we affirmatively believe that their debt is um, uh, something that we're willing to take on because the work that is to be done with the um, capital plan of the regional district is valid and important. And that's why it is placed before you. Uh, but uh, that no vote required is a peculiarity. And I just, um, though the committee does unanimously recommend to the council to go ahead and approve this order. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Is there any other comment? Okay, then we start with Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Alyssa Brewer? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Yes. Darcy DeMont? Yes. Lynn Griesmers? Yes. Mandy Jo Haneke? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan? Yes. 
Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. The vote is 12-0-0 with one absent. And we go to the last motion. And this one is regarding the assessment method. Andy? Yeah. Um, so we get to 2101, which comes at the end instead of the beginning. And I'm going to make a motion to adopt approval order FY2101 in order approving the Amherst uh, Pelham Regional School District budget in Wait a minute. Pause. This is one that needed fixed. So we have to, I think, read the title from the order itself. Yeah, I was going to say this is. Uh, we already voted I on Look at the motion so. sheet. It's. Uh, so this is the motion sheet is incorrect. So we're going yeah, to. Yeah. Um, that's the uh, problem of relying on motion sheets. Uh, I move to adopt approval order at, um, 2101 in order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District Assessment Method. Okay, is there a second? Second, Brian. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, so, then. Yeah, I, I just uh, really quickly point out that uh, this is the method that we agreed to at the court. Uh, four towns meeting and uh, if we don't adopt this then uh, uh, we are the anomalous town that forces the agreement that we were urging to happen to not happen um, and we would end up on the um, state um, statutory method uh, and so this is uh, the other three towns have taken this vote and uh, but it requires an affirmative vote of all four towns is unanimously recommended by the Finance Committee. Okay. Alyssa Brewer? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Yes. Darcy Dumont? Yes. Reese Mears, yes. Haneke? Yes. Darcy Pam? Yes. Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Steve Schreiber? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Valerie Ball Milne? Yes. Votes 12 0 0, 1 absent. And we move on to appointments, which we have already done in the consent agenda. And we actually therefore move on to committee reports. And so on the committee reports, let's begin and see if you have things to add. Community Resources Committee. Yes, I just have two things. The one I just want to point out that um, CRC uh, voted to recommend that the noise bylaw, the unlawful noise bylaw, not be modified at this time. So I thought I'd point that one out. The reasoning is in the report and all after discussion. It was a referral from the council. So we have not brought forward any recommended modifications or revisions to that bylaw. Um, and then the other thing is uh, there's a report due from CRC on the referral for the Wild Animal Act by July 6th. The report is going to be an oral report tonight, um, which is we are still considering it. We've had a brief presentation from the proponents earlier, um, and we hope to bring it back to the, count, to the CRC for a, potentially a final presentation um, to get it over to GOL sometime in July um, at our... Mm -hmm. July, I guess it would be the 14th meeting and hopefully we can get it to GOL after that or at the latest sometime in August. Um, actually, Serge, you can take that down because we're, um, and we don't need any more slides at this point. Thank you. You've done a fantastic job tonight, Serge. Um, the Finance Committee, Andy, anything else? Uh, just to remind everybody that we are in now the season where we are going to have the um, heads of all of the departments coming before the committee. And if any counselors are interested in attending, uh, they certainly are welcome to do so. Um, I don't know if uh, 
Athena would like to have knowledge of that so that in advance so that she can uh, also determine whether it needs to be posted as a council meeting if there's sufficient number of people coming. Um, the uh, Tomorrow is the uh, schools and library on July 2nd, which is uh, Thursday, is public safety and police and um, fire department EMS um, operating budgets could be um, a matter of public interest and council interest. And so I particularly want to alert you to that one. We are trying to get community services moved to another night as Mr. Bachman had previously reported. Um, so let me just mention, we did not post the one tomorrow as a committee of the whole, but Athena, let's make sure we do post them for the other three. And tomorrow during the one that we did not post that way, we'll just make sure that we have plenty of opportunity for public comment so that counselors can be part of the audience and comment. Okay. Um, Gov GOL, Governance Organization Legislation. Yes, thank you, Len. Um, two things quickly. Um, we meet on Wednesday and we will be conducting the interviews for um, resident non-voting members uh, for finance. Um, their SOIs, their statements of interest are available. Uh, they've been available now for the past week on the GOL uh, town website. Um, and we hope to bring forward a recommendation to the council at its next meeting. Um, also just briefly uh, in the report uh, covering the, the uh, resolution related to um, xenophobia, there was a discussion during that uh, dis uh, period about our use of consent agenda and when we have proclamations and resolutions. And I just urge people to look at it. I'm not sure this is the time to talk about it or whether we even need to talk about it. I thought it was handled well today, um, but there was some concern about the use of consent agenda where something like a proclamation or resolution um, is is there. It's there, but it's never actually publicly presented or um, and, and sort of made, made visible to the public. Um, I understand the desire for us to streamline our meetings. I, I think that's important. Um, anyway, it's in the report, people can look at it. I also should mention that uh, Brianna is working on a press release about that resolution and is seeking comments from the sponsors, uh, both the residents and the uh, counselors that sponsored. Okay. Uh, is there a JCPC uh, report at this point time? No, because we, we won't be meeting um... Uh, we might be meeting as soon as August, but the plan is not until September. Okay. And Town Services and Outreach Committee. Darcy? There are, there are two reports from the Town Services and Outreach Committee in the packet. We added a meeting to our calendar, so our next meeting is July 23rd. Um, and we're basically focusing on finalizing a review process. And Darcy, may I point out that your meetings now are switching to evenings, starting at what time? Uh, starting at 6.30 on alternate Thursdays. Okay. So that will, that will start um, on July 23rd. Right. Thank you. Um, We've done the approval of the minutes as part of the consent agenda. We're on to the town manager's report. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so if you've been downtown, you see all the um, lanes being blocked off, uh, still making some adjustments to that. Uh, many businesses have been open. The next on North Pleasant Street, uh, Amherst Coffee is getting ready to open along Amity Street. The next set of businesses that will open are on South Pleasant Street, uh, where Hastings is. And there's a, a block of restaurants there who are very eager to move forward. Uh, so that is all moving forward. Really good news. A lot of cooperation from the Business Improvement District and the um, Chamber of Commerce. Not afraid to get their their hands dirty or get paint on them as they've if, as they've cleaned up the uh, um, the uh, the Jersey barriers in a nice way. Our town. 
Puffer's Pond and Town Pools are open. I thought you'd care about that today, but um, they are open and with proper social distancing. And that's those are we keep making adjustments and tweaks as we learn more about how to make that work better. Uh, we're getting closer to um, having the Spray Park uh, uh, open and the Groff Park open. Um, we're looking, working with the, the president to look at some dates, probably July 8th, I think, um, for a virtual ribbon cutting of some sort, not sure exactly how, but to, to involve the council. So this is, a, this is a really good news story. If you haven't been to Groff Park, go there. Um, and it's, it's kind of, it's, it, we want to be able to celebrate something in these dark times that, because it's really a good thing. Uh, the spray park's not quite, the electrical still being worked on in, on, on the, uh, um, on the spray park, but we hope to have that up and running by the time we do our socially distanced uh, ribbon cutting of some sort. And so well, this is something that taxpayers and grant money came in for. So we wanna let people know that's a good thing. It's gonna be really exciting for the kids, I think. Um, and it's along the same lines, uh, we're looking to have a, a groundbreaking for the dog park, uh, probably around July 22nd. Um, so third week of July, basically, if we get all everything aligned, uh, again, the same type of thing where we'll have a ceremonial turning of the shovel and you know that is under contract. It will be take several months to actually construct it. It's just, it's a dog park, but it takes time. And then there's needs to be time for the grass to grow before, uh, so it could be withstand the traffic of dogs. So that's all really good news. Um, the other thing uh, I want to mention is that today you may have seen that the university put out its reopening plan. Um, they released that at two o'clock this afternoon and it, it calls for additional um, student, more students than we had anticipated. And, but um, I think that it's, they're responding to what the market is actually telling them, which is that um, there are a lot of students who want to be in Amherst and it's something that has us um, concerned and the university and the colleges have been very open and willing to have these conversations and with our health director, especially about what it means for the town, what it means for the town's people. Um, so, uh, so we will I'll keep you updated on what's coming out with that. Um, you know, it's going to be a complicated time because we have students coming back, um, wanting to be in Amherst and also wanting to see their friends and do all the things that you do when you're, when you're 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. And um, uh, so I think it, it'll be complicated, especially in the environment we're in now. And um, we'll see how it all works out. So that's the only things I want to bring up today. And answer any questions you, the council may have. Then you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, let me mention that I have already asked or mentioned to Paul that uh, we would like to put an item on an agenda sometime between now and the return of students to just talk about the impact of this in our town and how to, and anything that we as a council have to particularly say about it. I know we're hearing from residents and there are, there is concern about the return of students, although we are university town. Um, Dorothy, you have your hand up. Yes, um, in terms of the, um, I, I was confused about the opening and the ribbon cutting, cutting of Groff Park. I am very interested in an, an actual visit to Groff Park, socially distance, um, and maybe a video taking the things in motion. I mean, I think it's, I'm very excited. Um, so the July date is not in, I, I'm not so interested in a virtual ribbon cutting. I wanna go to Groff Park because when we do that, then the town knows they can go, right? So it should, it should coincide with when it's really the doors are open, shouldn't it? Yes, it, it's okay to respond to that, Lynn. Um, yes, please. So yes, so that's what we want it to be. If we can do it in person, we, we don't want to advertise it because we don't want a crowd because um, we don't want to create a situation like that. Um, you've read our minds, the staff, if we can, if we can pull together folks to do it, we'd like to do, you know, some of the things we thought about is behind the scenes, look from a kid's eye view of what the park's going to look like, you know, different creative things um, to generate some excitement. But again, we're trying to do everything where 
I'm not trying to create things that bring people together because that's not what we're about, but we do want to physically offer maybe a super long ribbon where you're all six feet apart. You all cut it somehow or something like that. That would be fun. Yeah. Could even have some, some test, ch some children that belong to staff perhaps, or. Oh, people are finding their way into the park, believe it or not. Excuse me? People are finding their way in. Oh, there, yes, okay. Right. okay. Pat, you have your hand up? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, let me lower it before I forget. Um, I'm, I'm delighted with that Puffer's Pond and the pool and things are opening and we found ways to uh, help cool off residents. However, several of us have brought our concerns uh, forward uh, about a cooling space for the homeless community uh, here in Amherst. And um, we, the schools have been rejected and rightfully so in terms of their uh, not cool buildings. But we haven't heard any update and I would like to know what's going on to uh, take care of our vulnerable population. They are part of our community. Right, no, I apologize for not getting back to you on that. Um, yeah, so we have looked at a lot of different options. I, we've noticed some, a, a lot of communities are not offering cooling centers uh, because their conflict, the, the idea is then you're bringing people into a, a space. And so you see the city of Springfield is not offering cooling centers. Um, we still recognize the need and talking with people in the field, it's about you know, 12, 15 folks that we're talking about. And so we're looking at different options in terms of you know, creating a place where people can be, where they can have shade, they can have cooling, some kind of cooling, they have chairs, they can have water, they can have power to charge phones and things like that. So we have a, a couple things um, in the works on that. Um, I can't really say exactly what those are right now, but there is, uh, um, I can tell you offline, I think, um, just because we're not prepared to make that announcement tonight, um, but uh, it's just a matter of getting all the materials that we need in place to be able to pull that off. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Evan, you have your hand up? Yeah, so I had a question for the town manager, but I also just wanted to add one thing because it was brought up. Um, I feel very uncomfortable about the possibility or the prospect of having an agenda item discussion about how to respond to students coming back to campus um, because I I worry about the possibility of it turning into an opportunity for the council or for the public to disparage students. We're a town that often is seen as unwelcome to students. I have students in my class, I talk to them all the time about the community. They don't feel like we want them here. We want to send the message we do want them here. And I do worry that if that conversation is not carefully framed, it will come off as something that is um, at worst hostile towards students, um, especially if we delve into the territory of a response that includes um, greater police presence or, or, or more aggressive, uh, especially in this current environment, um, more aggressive police enforcement. So I wanna make sure I say that before that ever gets onto an agenda. My question though for the town manager um, had, to do, had to do with the budget, but I thought it more appropriate to ask here, um, which is when you said that there were three uh, FTE reductions. One of them that I was expecting but didn't see um, and was happy about was um, in the town manager's office for the economic development director. Jeff left a very long time ago. I understand you've had a lot of things on your plate, but given that it does appear that there's still budgeted salary for the economic development director, is that something that's going to be going forward in the foreseeable future? Yes, um, so we, that was something we discussed about whether we should keep that in the budget or not because it was a big salary that we could address. We, uh, I felt strongly that it should stay in the budget. Um, we're looking at different configurations for that position. Um, pretty active conversations with uh, other groups about different ways to produce that, whether it's an actual job in the in the office. So, so um, and I've looked at other models as well. Um, so that in some communities, they have it not just economic development, but they have it for um, for um, arts and culture and economic development, because that's sort of who we are. It's not just economic development, so it is all those things. Um, and so I've looked at some models that might reconfigure that job a little bit. Um, 
we have a very good team at the chamber and the um, business improvement district right now and working really tightly and they're really eager to help move this position forward as well. So that position is in the budget right now. Okay. Steve Schreiber. Yeah, so I think you all know I, I work at UMass. And so my comments are really about the report that was released by UMass that you're referring to. And actually, I think there are probably three reports. And I think that uh, the one that you were showing is the one released by the chancellor. So there are lots of things to be alarming in that report from the perspective of the community. It really has not much to do with your opinion as to whether or not students should be living amongst us. But really, the, the main message there is that virtually no classes will be taught face-to-face -face at UMass. But if you want to come back to Amherst area, then you're welcome to come back. So a very limited number of people will be welcomed to the campus, and they'll only be able to do so under very strict guidelines. Everyone else, and in fact, I might even say that, that there's pressure on the rental units. So everyone else who's being welcome back is being welcome back to not the campus itself, but to the area around the campus. So to me, that's a huge alarm because basically what it's suggesting is that the campus is de-densified. The same number of people are being welcomed back. The campus is being de-densified to prevent the virus from spreading on the campus. But the, so the surrounding areas by, if you do the math, the surrounding areas will be more densified so, and they have triggers in there that if there's a spike in COVID in the surrounding communities, then we'll take these steps and those steps. But it seems like the, um, the appearance of the document is that they're creating a cloistered community, um, basically putting a wall around UMass. If you choose to live within the wall, you must do this and this and that. You, I think it actually says you may not go outside except for emergencies, you know, you may not go outside of the cloister, good luck enforcing that. Or, or, and you may not go inside the cloister without answering all these questions. So it's a, a plan that is trying to make a campus that's largely residential, residential again, but there's lots of gaps in there. And I totally agree that we shouldn't be disparaging the students, but nor do I think it's a very solid plan of how we're gonna repopulate both the town and the campus. So more questions for me than answers. And keep in mind that virtually none of these students are actually taking courses on campus. They'll be taking courses wherever, whatever apartment they're in. Dorothy. Following up on that, if you live on the campus and you um, test positive for COVID, you can quarantine on the campus. But if you are living in the town and you po test positive for COVID, you may not enter the campus for quarantine. I read that today and I thought, wow, that, that, is, that means we want the students. Then we, the town, may have to come up with and provide quarantine spaces for them. George. Yeah, I, I guess I wanna echo some of the concerns. Um, I'm not trying to at all by any means stir up any student feeling, but I do think that um, this is gonna present a real challenge to us. I'm sure Paul is very aware of it. And I'm sure his staff are thinking hard about it, but I think we need to be as proactive as we can. And we're really talking about student behavior. So I'm thinking about one of the more uh, a positive success stories over the last few years um, where off-campus student life, um, uh, people like uh, 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 Sally Lanowski and so forth uh, walk this way. I wonder if there's a, an area here for working together with groups that have been very effective peer to peer. Um, I don't think we want the police involved if at all possible. It's not gonna be very effective, but I think we're going to have an issue with student behavior um, and it's going to upset understandably a sizable number of people in the community and so any ways we can think of being proactive, any ways we can nurture relationships with groups like the off-campus student life people and their very effective peer programs might be something to look into and we don't have a lot of time. 
Okay, any other? Yes, Paul, please. So those are all really good points there. And there are other things too, you know, um, the, today we talked about the peer to peer program and how is that, is that gonna be up and running? Is that gonna be something we can take advantage of or not? Um, contact tracing, we, do we have the capacity in town to take on the contact tracing that might have to happen? And how is that gonna work? Um, there are a number of things that concern us town officials um, and I think there will be just a higher sensitivity amongst our populace to um, gatherings, you know, um, normal gatherings that people might have just driven by in the past. Now people will identify people are social, not social distancing, they don't have masks on, and that's going to create calls. And how is that, how are we going to manage that, especially in a situation where um, police may not be as welcome as previous, not that they were ever necessarily welcome, but there could create a conflict um, that's beyond the interaction that's going on. And that concerns us in a lot of different ways. So um, being alert to those things, messaging to the students before they come to, um, come to town. Uh, the students are, many students are already in town because uh, there are not a lot of summer jobs out there and this is where you'd rather be. Um, so I think that some people reference the, um, you know, the landlords of large buildings seeing waiting lists, which is true um, from what I'm told. Um, and so there, I think there will be a demand for space. And I think one of the things, this is me speculating, the university was saying is, if there's such demand, why are we, we can op we can accommodate more people versus putting more pressure on the town and the apartments in the town. So, um, but we, we need to have the, we have to have those conversations. We have to be on the same page. Um, we have to be reinforcing the messages. Um, and we have to cut, we may need, we need to have a, a way of um, addressing the, the, number of complaints I anticipate that we will receive. We're already receiving uh, complaints from people who see people gathering around a fire in their backyard. Um, and, but people are just concerned about, and, and you, see the, you see the instance in Michigan and what a super spreader event one night or one weekend can become. So, um, so yeah, it, lots of concerns for us. And it's not just us. I think it's every college town, every college community. Anytime you're going to create a place where people from all over the country, all over the world come into a place, whatever it is, whatever the event is, is you need to be alert to what you're choosing to do. And I think the university and the colleges have done a lot of deep thinking on this um, and they have tried to assemble a lot of um, capabilities on their own in terms of testing and protocols and things like that. It's easier for a smaller college than it is for a university that's 10 times the size of a small college and a public university that has, you know, you, you can't put a wall around the university. So I think it's a, it's a big challenge for them. And um, it, it, I don't envy them trying to make these decisions, honestly. Mandy, Joe, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm just gonna be quick about this. Is there a cost consideration that we're talking to the university about um, in terms of additional contact tracing costs due to needs and all that might not be there right now, but would be there with a full population of a campus um, and who might be bearing those costs and whether they might be reimbursable under COVID? You don't have to answer the question now. I just wanted to bring it up as um, one of the things that I feared in reading the report was that the campus was pushing some of the potential issues and problems off on the town instead of keeping them on campus. Um, but I do want to say at the same time, we've had students here all summer and our transmission rate is very low. Um, that is, would not be that way if not if everyone wasn't taking responsibility for keeping it that way. So I think we can have a positive experience with students here, but I, I think um, there are considerations that you, UMass and we need to be talking about. 
So just to respond to that, our health director has superb working relationships with the health director at the university and the emergency management director at the university. They pretty much manage their own campus on a lot of this contact tracing and things like that. They, they take on a lot of that responsibility themselves. Um, if there are costs that can be attributed to COVID-19, we do categorize that and keep that and track that separately and seek reimbursement under our $3.4 million um, allotment that we have. Um, but yeah, it's the type of thing we, we would have that conversation with them about as well. And it's more, it's not like, how can you pay for it? It's more, how do you, we, we problem solve together. That's how we really approach it. Melissa. Speaking of not using the police to ticket people, you know, rather than just an educational way, but again, you know, as you were sensitive to just an educational way may not be well received this these days. The other thing I want to bring up because it's been brought up in a couple of different venues, even though I'm somewhat loath to bring it up is, as we know, our complaint system for inspection is complaint driven. And what I don't want to see is people complaining that the four unrelated persons bylaw needs to be enforced because it doesn't. So it hasn't been it up until now. And this pandemic is not a reason to start enforcing that. But having just offered this suggestion, unfortunately, to the public who are watching, if people do start calling and complaining more about four unrelated, I'm not sure how we're going to manage that. And I want to make it clear that I, if, if there's going to be a change in our enforcement of that bylaw, I think we need to discuss it as a community. Are there any other questions or comments at this time? Okay, um, town council comments. I don't have any additional comments. I've made them throughout the evening. Um, any future agenda items? Uh, Darcy? Yeah, I just wanted to um, suggest that we, now that the, the Crocker Farm study is um, virtually complete, that we should get that on our agenda to have a presentation. I've actually written a um, email to the school uh, uh, committee chair uh, to ask if we could do a joint one like we did for the Fort River study. And we're looking for a mutual date. It'll probably be on a Tuesday and we would probably attend their meeting for about an hour like we did before. Okay. Kathy. Paul sent us a note about Sunday, um, July 5th at 2 p.m. Frederick Douglass um, uh, participating in a reading on what, what to the state, what to the slave is the 4th of July. And um, I was asked by our North Amherst community to make sure people knew about it um, and they're going to put a note in, but I'm wondering if the town is putting it up on our website at all. I mean, it was very nice for you to give us the alert and how to um, link up, Paul, but I, you know, just sort of raising awareness. I mean, I, real, I realize the timeline is very short. It's this weekend. It's on our website. And, and I just did, that is a spectacular thing to participate in. It was really moving to my family and me yes, last year, and we've done it like two or three years, but it's just such a remarkable piece of writing that it's really worth reading it aloud every year. Okay. Any further comments? Any counselor comments? Uh, we have no other topics. We have no executive session. I call the meeting adjourned at 9.56. Way to go.